webinar today. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we're good. Great. So again, this is Sylvie Chibrowski with Kearns and West. And we're gonna get started in a moment with a welcome from Liz. I'm sorry, I'm getting some echo, so just one moment. Okay. We're gonna get started in a moment with a welcome from Liz with the State Forest Department. But before we do that, I'm gonna go over some of the webinar protocols. Okay, so as we go through the meeting, we hope that you've all been able to join through the webinar link and are either using your computer or phone for audio. If you have any issues, please just chat myself or any of the co-hosts of the meeting and when you make a comment we ask that you please put yourself off of mute but keep yourself on mute throughout the meeting and when we have our q a and discussion portions just please use the raise your hand button to get in the queue and we'll show you how to do that in just a moment and if you do have a comment or a question just please your name or if affiliation before you speak so that we know who's making the comments. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. And if you're not able to make a comment verbally, you can email Jason Cox at the email address that's up on the screen right now. All right, and next slide. You have all likely become experts at Zoom over the past couple of months, but in case you haven't, here are just some of the features here. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see the mute and video buttons to turn your video on and off, and then also to mute and unmute yourself. You also have a participant list, which you can click on and open to see who's in the meeting. And that's a great place to also mute yourself and raise your hand. And the next slide. Um, you're also able to use the chat. So for this meeting, we have chat limited with just the hosts. So if you need to say anything to the host, please do that. And then next slide. Um, and we said this a couple of times before the meeting started, but we'd ask that you also please put your full name and your affiliation as your participant name. So you can do that by opening the participant list and clicking the little rename button that shows up when you hover over your name. And just a couple of other things. Um, we will have a PowerPoint presentation for the whole meeting and you can change the videos you see by either using the speaker view or gallery view. If you click one more time, Troy. Um, and then there's also this kind of little bar that you can move left and right to make the PowerPoint bigger or the video bigger, depending on what you want to see. Okay. And before we go into a welcome from Liz Dent, you know, we don't have time for a whole round of introductions. We have 97 participants here. So we're just going to launch a poll. It's not perfect because you can only pick one option, but just to get a sense of who's here in the room, we ask that you just let us know, you know, are you coming in as a member of an agency or a representative from industry, recreational group, et cetera. And we'll leave this poll open for a little bit as Liz makes her welcome. Um, and then we'll show the results at the end. And I think that's it. With that, I will hand it over to Liz Dent. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate your time and interest and, and what a great turnout. So my name is Liz Dent and I serve as the State Forest Division Chief for the Department of Forestry. Um, we're um, tasked with stewards of these lands and this HCP uh, covering um, all of our ownership for the Board of Forestry lands and some of the common school forest lands west of the Cascades. 
So that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Really important moment in time uh, for the division um, as well as for the future management of these lands. So it's really, really a very exciting um, time. Um, <clears throat> we have been at this for quite a while. So truly do appreciate everyone's patience in waiting for the information we're bringing today. Folks for quite a while have been saying that they wanna see more detail and that it's difficult to weigh in without seeing that kind of detail. And so really appreciate people um, giving us the time to get to where we are today. And we have quite a bit of information to represent or to present with, for you today. Um, it's been, it's taken a while to get to this point. Um, although I would argue it's actually been moving very quickly um, for a number of reasons. We've put together um, a really helpful um, structure with um, all the participating agencies and those being ODFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marines Fisheries Service, DEQ, Department of State Lands, um, and OSU, all as representatives on our scoping team, which is our technical group, um, and then representatives from those same agencies on the steering committee. And with having those two bodies at play, we're able to really make sure we have alignment from the technological science perspective up through the policy making and, and the policy lens. Um, and so it's been really helpful for success to this point and does take a little bit more time to work through all that because we really wanna make sure that all that content that's being driven from either one of those committees is shared and, and we have alignment um, between those committees before rolling that stuff out into the public. So we know folks have been really um, hungry for it um, and we really wanted to, to wait until today when we could get, provide it to everyone all at one time. So it should be a good meeting today for everyone to kind of see where things are going. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to emphasize is that um, this is a work in progress and we have heard loud and clear that folks need to see, uh, are, are needing to see the details. Um, and so we're in the, in the name of sort of transparency sharing it with everyone today, but I really do want folks to recognize that this, there's still some more work to be done and some of this stuff may change a little bit yet again while we go back and do more analysis and review. So it's really important to recognize this is a work in progress. And as these materials will be developed and refined, we'll continue bringing them to the public and, and sharing with you uh, what we're learning. So why are we pursuing an HCP? Um, I, I'm not, you know, we've got a bigger group today than we've had before so that some of this information is repeat for some folks that have been tracking this for quite a while and new for others I'm imagining. But um, basically to the Board of Forestry, our governing body, directed the Department of Forestry to pursue an HCP for our lands west of the Cascades. And the, the notion is with an HCP, the benefit of an HCP um, as compared to what we do now is to have long to have some long term certainty regulatory certainty to manage these lands um, and comply with the endangered species act and um, what the HCP does is provides us with um, that a long term perspective multi decades uh, so that uh, Oregonians and rural communities and counties uh, have assurance on how these lands are going to be managed, uh, both for conservation as well as for economic and social benefits. So it's a really powerful tool, um, provides certainty in the face of great uncertainty as compared to what we do now, which is to manage these lands uh, without an HCP. Um, and that um, puts us in a situation where anytime there's a new listing for a threatened endangered species or the conservation strategies change for any existing uh, species that has, is already listed, we're in a constant sort of treadmill trying to keep up with what's going on. The HCP takes us out of that year to year framework and puts together a plan that's really benefits the species um, for the longer time frame, 50 to 70 years, depending on the final um, terms of the agreement. So the board directed us to take this approach and they asked us to use what we call a three phased approach. And the first phase was to conduct a business analysis to determine if an HCP is in the best interest of the state. 
and the board indeed agreed that it was and last fall directed us to move into phase two which has been to develop the conservation strategies and work towards um, an administrative draft of an hcp so we're here we are in july so since november we've been working on that and we're, we're sharing with you what we know today we'll continue doing that up through october and at the board's meeting in october we'll bring our findings to them and they'll make a decision as to if they want us to continue moving into the third and final phase which is to begin to move into the NEPA process so those are the three phases the scoping or the um, business case which is done the strategy development we're in the middle of that right now if we like what we see and the board wants us to keep working on it after October then we move into NEPA um, between now and then uh, and actually at the end of this month July 22nd is a meeting with the Board of Forestry and we'll be going over all the material we're sharing with you today. We will go over with the board on July 22nd to brief them on where we are in the process. So with that, that's a pretty rapid overview, but I'll turn it back to you, Sylvia, and you can let us know what the survey shows. Are you on mute, Sylvia? It's saying connecting to audio on yours. I don't know if there's a little problem. Nope. Can you try again? You may have a bandwidth problem because it looks like it's trying to help you come through. Are you able to hear there me now? Go. Yep, now we got you. Good. Okay. All right, so thanks everyone for participating in the poll. Here are the results. And again, we didn't have time for full introductions, but it's helpful to just see who's here. So we see a good mix of folks um, from the county, conservation and industry groups. We have a few scoping team and steering committee members as well, and a number of folks from federal and state agencies. So thanks for that. All right, I'll turn it back over to you, Deb. Great, thank you. So if we can move on now to the agenda. Um, great, thanks so much. So this is Deb Noodleman, part of the Kearns and West Facilitation Team, part of the project team. We just cannot thank you enough, everyone, for being here today. I'm gonna move through a number of high-level topics in Orient you really um, efficiently, and I mostly just wanna let you know that on behalf of the project team, whenever we say that word, we're speaking about the members of Oregon Department of Forestry, from the ICF technical team, from Oregon Consensus, and Kearns and West as part of your process team people. And so all of these folks are working together diligently to help bring this information forward to develop the HCP and are here today and, and between all of these meetings to be available to you, as Liz said, to help answer questions and to help you also um, have your, your interests addressed throughout the process. So welcome, welcome. And it looks like in total, we're up to 112 people. So it's a great crowd and we're thrilled that you could make time today. We know you have many other things you could be doing and we're also hoping you're staying safe and healthy during these challenging times. So for today's meeting, we have two main purposes. Um, the first is that it's really an opportunity to learn about the components of the aquatic and the terrestrial conservation strategies. And as Liz said, there has been so much work going into this piece and uh, the project team's really pleased to present and, and open up the discussion on these pieces. And secondly, to hear the results of the aquatic conservation strategy modeling and the species habitat modeling. So lots of big topics, lots of great substance to share. We are going to ask as we talk through these topics, if you could kindly hold your questions till the end of each of the sets of presentations, write yourself some notes with the questions you have. Um, and I'll talk in just a few minutes about how we want to manage the Q&A section. Um, but lots of great information to get through. And then for the topics themselves, what you're looking at on the screen is the agenda. So I'm right here doing the intro piece. We'll start with updates to the HCP. And for some of you, you've been through this before, but it's that really important piece of where have we been, where are we at, and where are we going in the HCP development process. So you'll be hearing just really high level on that to orient people as to where we are in the process overall. And then the next big topic is about the conservation strategies themselves, um, including the topic of the aquatic modeling and the terrestrial modeling, 
deep dive in a really good chunk of time. We hope on that topic enough to both hear the presentation and allow for some question and answer time. Next is walking through the forest management modeling update. Again, so you know what's the work that's been done to date, where is it at and what's left to do. Um, we'll probably, time's gonna go quickly, so we'll get to the summary and next steps, which includes some of the specific steps about following up with stakeholders and also um, moving forward with the rest of the HCP development process. And I think you all know this, but the official meeting time ends at 3.30, and then we leave an extra hour from 3.30 to 4.30 that's really just about the Q&A questions, answer, group discussion. And I'm just hoping you can all kind of feel like you're in a room together throughout this meeting, but especially as we head to that last hour where we're gonna to try to manage as many of the questions as we can out of the queue, see if there's even a space for a little bit of dialogue. And then we hope it's for some of you that used to come to the in-person meetings, it's where folks just stayed in the room and talked to each other together. So we're gonna create a little bit of that virtual meeting experience in that last hour, and then we'll officially adjourn the full meeting at 4.30. Um, so we're hoping all that's making sense to you. We are asking that, um, you know, there is chat down at the bottom of the screen, and we are gonna ask people to limit what you call the chat box conversations. We're hoping that you can get questions with your hands raising, but the other way we're hoping that you'll be able to get questions in is through email to Jason Cox. And I don't know, Sylvia, did we ever get that email up on the screen? But it is jasonrcox at oregon.gov. And that's all available on the website. You can find it. And he's really the conduit to get your written comments in and submitted. And remember that we're not in official comment phase. This is input during the HCP development process, okay? And then the last piece is as we're going through the meeting time in this up until 3.30 timeframe, if we see that questions get raised but we don't have enough time to get to them, the Kearns and West team will also kind of start to collect those throughout the meeting time and we can bring them back up on the screen if that helps during the 3.30 to 4.30 time, okay? So lots of different pieces just to keep in mind. The main is that you're gonna see the cycle of brief presentations then allowing some time for question and answer. Um, Sylvia, I didn't actually get to do the ground rules at the beginning. So maybe if we could just pop those up on the screen. Um, I just want to walk every sure, three Troy. I don't know who has them. You'll go back a few slides, Troy. Yeah, I'm not sure. Did we walk through those, Sylvia? We did at the beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so if I could just for a minute, oh, I'm sorry. I could just talk them through. I didn't mean to take you back. I was thinking they were right there again. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to say the words, guys, so we can just head right on back in. So here's the few quick reminders, and you all know this if you were in a room for a stakeholder meeting. The main is honoring the agenda. The second is listening to learn and understand, and really having the chance to listen to what each other is saying. Try to understand what are the interests that people are speaking to? Why do they care so deeply about those topics? And trying to stand in each other's shoes as well as this project team, and most importantly, Oregon Department of Forestry and what it's trying to do on behalf of all of you as it develops the HCP. And the second really biggest message in our ground rules has to do with the balance of speaking time. There are a lot of people on this call and you'll mostly be in listening mode today. And if you have a chance to ask a question, it's great. We're gonna ask you to raise your hand in a balance of speaking time kind of way, which means if the same people keep raising their hands, and there's more on the list, I'm gonna skip over a few and go down to the folks that haven't had a chance to ask a question yet. So I hope that folks will understand when I'm doing that. Um, we wanna hear from as many people as possible, hear those different voices and perspectives as well as we can for the limited time we have today. And then the last piece, which I've said a few times, is in addition to these open to public meetings, please remember there's opportunity for small group stakeholder meetings. Um, after each of these sets of meetings, there's a wealth of information on the website that we really encourage you to go and look at that lets you take your own deep dive on the information. And the last piece is really the one-on-one -on -one contacts as needed with Oregon Department of Forestry. So I think, anybody from the project team think I forgot anything? Anything else I need to introduce? No? All right, I think we're ready to go. So Troy, I think you've got the first topic here. Yep. Thanks, Deb. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, Troy Ramick with ICF. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, ICF was retained by the Oregon Department of Forestry to help with the, the technical development of the HCP. Um, and uh, thanks, Liz, for a great overview uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I won't spend much time here today on the HCP program update, um, but just wanted to uh, do a, a, a quick kind of reiteration of some of the points uh, Liz made and then, uh, and then address a couple of additional things. One is, um, we have been at this a while, and a lot of you have heard a lot of this information before, um, and the work uh, has, that has been ongoing recently, uh, a lot of technical work at the, at the scoping team level, and um, a lot of work with the steering committee, as Liz mentioned. You're gonna hear about a lot of that work today um, from the group, uh, so I'm not gonna steal anybody's thunder there and, and, um, and get into it too quickly, but I did wanna recenter us for a second on, um, you know, sort of the purpose of the HCP and and where it applies and what it is, and a reminder that um, you know the HCP is really a document, a habitat conservation plan, really a document that is is developed uh, to facilitate an application um, to the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service for an incidental take permit under the Endangered Species Act. So that's really what we're after here. Um, everything that we're doing is really sort of uh, in service of threatened and endangered species, both some that are uh, currently listed and some that we think may become listed um, over the over the, a period of, of years. And so when we're going through the habitat conservation planning process, it um, by definition is a very species centered process. Uh, and so the conservation strategies you're going to hear about today have been developed really uh, intentionally to um, avoid, minimize, and mitigate effects to those uh, those covered species. And we've talked about the species list before. It hasn't changed uh, since we talked to you last. So if you've been at this with us for a while, um, nothing new here. But um, for those who are new to the process, uh, just a note that this HCP um, is really addressing the species you see on the screen here, uh, nine uh, uh, covered fish species, uh, seven wildlife species, a uh, little bit of overlap there. We have um, two aquatic salamander species, the Columbia and Cascade Torrent salamanders that are technically wildlife but occur in the aquatic environment. Um, you'll note here with the asterisks uh, next to some of the species, not all these species as I mentioned are currently listed, but um, based on what we know about the species, uh, we have a pretty good uh, indication that there's that they could become listed over the uh, next you know period of years or decades and so we have the opportunity with the HCP to include them uh, on the permits just like the the listed species and create uh, do an effects analysis on those species do uh, create conservation strategies for them so that if they become listed over uh, over time um, the Oregon Department of Forestry has already already has a plan for those species, so they're already addressed. And this gets to the the sort of the central benefit that Liz raised earlier of creating some certainty over time uh, about how um, operations will occur on state forest lands. Uh, and of course, those uh, that certainty comes in the form of economic certainty. It comes in the form of operational certainty. Uh, it also comes in the form of conservation certainty. So that's a really core benefit and, and element of what we're trying to achieve with, with this HCP and really with any HCP. Um, just to put put a graphic to the timeline and, and the process that, um, that Liz touched on. So you've seen a version of this before. We've now, of course, expanded it because we're a little bit further into the process and can look forward a little bit better than we could in the past. Um, what I'm showing you here is, is sort of a linear timeline that shows, um, first of all, in blue, uh, really the work that we've been doing up until now. You've heard about a lot of this work, but um, the, the individual arrows here represent uh, key elements of the, of the habitat conservation plan, um, including some of the background information, environmental setting, and, and covered activities, um, the conservation strategy, which you're going to hear a lot about today, uh, and then uh, near the end, I'll give a, a brief update on kind of where things stand with the effects analysis, uh, the monitoring and adaptive management program and with implementation and cost and funding because that work is also ongoing. But um, taken together, uh, those elements really uh, 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 wind up in what we call the first administrative draft of the HCP. Um, what we're striving to do at this point in time, as, as you've heard already today, is that we have a, uh, an important decision in front of the Board of Forestry in October. 
And as we get towards October, we are trying to develop these key elements of the HCP in enough detail that we can understand um, you know, that the certainty that I described. We can understand the economic and the conservation certainty and the operational certainty. Um, and we can also understand sort of the cost and funding of what it would mean to do uh, for the Oregon Department of Forestry to do an HCP over, over time. The board has asked, um, has asked us to actually present that information in comparison to what life would look like without an HCP. So we're working on an analysis, what we're calling a comparative analysis, um, that will allow the board to weigh um, what, what life would look like uh, to manage the, uh, state forest lands under an HCP with uh, what it would look like to manage state forest lands without an HCP. And they will use that information and that comparative analysis to inform their decision in October about how to move forward. Now, it doesn't mean we're done in October. Uh, and as you see on the slide here, um, you know, we're sort of showing October here as that, that Board of Forestry meeting date, early October. Um, even after that board meeting, there will certainly be enough detail put together by that point in time so that the board can make an informed decision. But we know that even after October, there will still need to be some refinements made um, to the information that we have, have brought to bear at that point. Um, so we'll be refining the first administrative draft of the HCP. Um, a lot of those refinements will be more on kind of the administrative side. So what will implementation look like? You know, how will sort of the, the nuts and bolts fit together uh, to actually put a, a, a new program on the ground uh, into the future? Uh, and um, importantly, what, what, won't, what won't change after October is anything that will sort of fundamentally uh, uh, influence uh, the expectations we have about the cost and funding of the program, the conservation benefits, the economic benefits over time. So all of that information that the board has asked for to inform their decision, um, the refinements that occur after October, you know, won't be such that there's any, any fundamental changes there. So I think what you see by October uh, will be, you know, sort of a 80 to 90% of the way there and we'll just be tweaking things after that. Um, at some point then early next year, NOAA Fisheries, who has agreed to be the, uh, the lead on the NEPA process, will be kicking off that NEPA process formally with a, with a formal um, NEPA scoping period. Um, in preparation for that, that some of that work uh, is already sort of started to begin, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, really just uh, getting organized at this stage for what the NEPA process might look like so that, you know, when the HCP is ready and NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service feel like it's, uh, it's a good time to move into the NEPA process, um, that process can start in earnest. Um, again, that's likely to be uh, sometime uh, in uh, early 2021. We have put it as March. Uh, there's nothing uh, magical about March. That's just about when we think it will occur. It could be a little earlier, or a little later than that. Um, and then importantly, uh, another thing that will be happening right after uh, the October decision uh, by the board um, will be that a companion FMP will begin to be developed. So, um, you know, the HCP is not a replacement for the FMP. The Oregon Department of Forestry will still have to produce a forest management plan um, that basically, you know, enacts uh, everything that they, they want and need to do on state forest lands. The HCP and the permits to go along with it are really then just um, the regulatory permits that allow them to implement that FMP. So the FMP, the companion FMP will still need to be developed. That work will begin, um, you know, soon after October and will carry forward into, um, you know, mid 2022. Um, at, at the middle of 2022, the, the Board of Forestry um, will then have, you know, a complete HCP, a completed NEPA process with all of the public input that goes along with that. Um, and a companion FMP in front of them for their decision, uh, yet another decision point later in 2022. So I know that we've done a lot, um, you know, last year and, and to get us to this point this year, and, and certainly a lot of work has been done. Um, but this graphic is really meant to illustrate that there is still, you know, as Liz mentioned, phase three of the overall process to play out. Um, there are many steps yet to go, but we're at a, a pretty fundamental point in the in the overall process uh, today and, and even further uh, in October. So um, I'll pause there for a moment, Deb, and see if anybody has any questions about the planning process or, or, or anything before we move into the technical elements. Great. So this was the, this is Deb again, this is the high level introduction and 
This is our first chance we can take just a couple clarifying questions. And if you remember at the bottom of your participant list, there's a place where you can raise your hand. And that's our way to know somebody might wanna ask a clarifying question. And I always take help from the project team if I miss a hand. Um, and in Zoom, people should pop up to the top of the list if they have one. Many of you have kindly done your homework and know this, and we like to just kind of stick with that, where you've been, where you're at, and where you're going. So I don't see, Troy, any questions to you right now. So I think it's okay to keep going. Did I miss anybody? No? All right. Great. Well, um, good. I will, we're going to get into the, the technical aspects now, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike Wilson. Um, and Mike, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to click through the slides, so I know you have some animation on some of your slides. So just, just tell me to click when it's time to click, and I'll, um, I'll do my best. Hey, uh, Deb and Troy, no problem. Jump in, or Mike, can we just jump in real quickly? Apologies, this is Liz Dent. Just one of the things we wanted to be clear about. We showed that timeline is really helpful, I think, for folks ideally to help you see how this is all mapped out. But if you want to make that the board has a decision to make in October, and they may or may not decide for us to move into the NEPA process. So that is, if they decide not to move into NEPA, then we're going to have a whole different kind of work plan. But just did want to make that point for everybody. Great point, yep. Yeah. Sorry, Mike, for interrupting. Oh, no problem. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Wilson. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the Resource Support Unit Manager for the State Forest Division. And uh, both my staff and I have been heavily involved in the HCP development to date. And what I'm going to do today is give you uh, an update on the status of our conservation strategy development. So I'd like to begin with our riparian conservation strategies. The uh, riparian conservation strategy is designed to meet the biological goals and objectives for listed fish species, as well as the Cascade and Columbia torrent salamanders. Um, this is accomplished through, a conservation, through conservation actions that focus on providing for a properly functioning aquatic system over time. The core of it is our riparian conservation areas. <clears throat> and they provide buffered areas with little or no management around streams and stream related features that allow for the natural recruitment of wood into the aquatic system, limit temperature impacts, and minimize sediment delivery. Also important is our road, man, uh, road system management where management direction and best management practices for roads will minimize the potential for impacts of the transportation network to streams. And finally, there are restoration activities that will be implemented to provide key habitat features in a shorter time frame, using activities that range from small-scale wood enhancement projects to larger floodplain reconnection projects. Taken all together, they basically comprise a holistic strategy that tries to leverage both natural processes and specific uh, best management practices and restoration potential um, across the landscape. Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned, the focus is on key processes for in-stream habitat. <clears throat> um, basically, we are trying to promote in-stream habitat complexity primarily through wood recruitment but we're also minimizing stream temperature increases and ameliorated in, ameliorating increased uh, stream temperatures that do occur to minimize the impacts to fish bearing streams. Minimizing sediment delivery, both the uh, buffers around streams and the roads practices provide that holistic approach to addressing the functional uh, uh, functions throughout, including sediment delivery and routing. The primary component of the strategy is to achieve these, uh, to achieve these goals uh, are the riparian conservation areas. And the RCAs are essentially stream buffers applied in a tiered fashion. They're dependent on stream classification with corresponding minimum buffer width. The buffer distances are in horizontal distances, which translates to a greater effective slope distance 
as a dream as stream adjacent slope increases. And I'll give you a little bit more on that in a minute. The riparian conservation areas basically receive little to no management. Exceptions such as road, road uh, crossings uh, will be estimated for the effects analysis based on their general frequency of occurrence and be reported on annually during implementation. And we'll use best management to protect streams in those cases. Um, where there are exceptions for restoration projects that may have uh, uh, both short-term impacts as well as short-term uh, benefits. Uh, there is a meet and confer process established uh, as part of HCPs where we can go to the services and get specific uh, advice on those uh, activities. And next slide. So before we go over the RCA widths themselves, um, I want to present a, just a little bit of additional detail on both the aquatic zone and horizontal uh, versus slope distance, just so we're all clear on that. So Troy, you can go ahead and click through the next three. Yeah, and so basically what we see here is, just to be clear, where the black arrow denotes where the buffer width starts in the RCAs. So on a stream with a well-defined bank, it might start there, but where we have uh, stream-associated wetlands, side channels that create sinuosity, or seeps and springs, the uh, RCA will uh, begin at the edge of those features and extend outward. Regarding slope, um, we are using horizontal buffers not slope distance buffers. So as slope distance increases, um, they actually have a greater effective distance. You can go ahead and click there, Troy. And so, you know, for instance, on the 70% slope, that 120 foot horizontal buffer becomes 146 feet. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify those things. And so there we go. Um, so this, these tables here show the actual buffer distance of the riparian conservation areas. So for our type F streams, our fish bearing streams, large, medium, and small streams all receive a 120 foot RCA buffer. Seasonal type F streams, which are very infrequent on our landscape, very rare, receive a 50-foot buffer. Um, that is because these seasonal streams do not have a particular uh, shade or wood recruitment function associated with them. For our type, uh, for our non-fish streams, large and medium streams are still buffered at 120 feet. Again, that's not a feature that we have very many of on the landscape. Most of our large and medium streams, of course, have fish in them. For our small streams, small perennial type in streams will have a base uh, buffer width of 35 feet, except for 500 feet above the ex upper extent of fish use. That 500 feet extending up from the upper extent of fish use will have a 120 foot buffer continued. So that allows for additional, both additional temperature protection and for additional wood recruitment. And we'll see more about that in a minute when I get into the, uh, the aquatic modeling that we did. For potential uh, debris flow tracks and high energy, both seasonal types uh, non-fish streams, they have a base buffer width as well of 35 feet. But for that same 500 feet above the upper extent of fish use, they have a 50-foot buffer instead of a 35-foot buffer. And this is to help reduce the impact to the uh, type F stream and also to uh, accommodate some extra wood delivery at that point. And that's all I had on that slide. 
So here's a couple of diagrams. Uh, the first one here is the pretty simple um, example where we have a 50-foot buffer on a seasonal type F stream that flows into a type F stream at the top. Uh, again, we don't have many of those occurring on our landscape. The next one down shows a seasonal type end that is either a potential debris flow track or a high energy stream delivering right into a type F stream. So a 35 foot buffer is the base buffer for that, but within 500 feet of the type F, uh, of the uh, actual fish use, it has a 50 foot buffer. And then the last example is a seasonal other type stream. It doesn't have any particular debris flow or high energy potential. And it does not have a tree buffer, but has an equipment restriction zone of 35 feet, along with certain vegetative disturbance guidelines. Okay, next slide. And so here we see some of the strategies put together a little bit. In the top example, we see where there is a type F stream. And I'm sorry, this diagram does have one error on it, it looks like. Um, that is a perennial type F stream at the bottom with a 120-foot buffer. And a small perennial type F dumps into that stream. So above the upper extent of fish use on that small perennial type F, where we have a small perennial type N, the 120 foot buffer is continued for another 500 feet. Again, we've been calling this the temperature protection zone, but of course it functions for both temperature protection and also for wood recruitment. Above that point, the buffer goes back down to 35 feet. And then when it goes to the uh, perenniality initiation point, that 35 foot buffer is continued for another 100 feet that we call the transition zone. And that's basically to ensure that we have the correct, we have a, a, a bit of room for error in our perenniality initiation point designation, given that in any given year, it could be different. So we want to make sure that we accommodate that. And then above that, we go to the equipment restriction zone of 35 feet around the seasonal type N. And the situation below, we have a potential debris flow track that runs from an initiation point upslope down through a seasonal stretch and then to the small perennial type N before delivering to the type F stream. In this case, the additional 50 foot buffer that would normally be on the uh, potential debris flow track is actually completely accommodated within the 120 foot temperature protection zone because it's trans uh, traversing a small perennial type N first. So we can see that the temperature protection zone takes care of that and then the buffer goes down to 35 feet with a small perennial type in through the perenniality initiation point all the way up into the seasonal stretch and up and around the potential debris flow track initiation point. Okay, next slide. So we tested this strategy using some modeling uh, terrain works with uh, Lee Benda and Dan Miller conducted modeling to validate the adequacy of the buffering strategies. And so the biological goals and objectives focus on two things that were modeled, thin stream habitat structure, primarily through wood recruitment, and water quality and quantity. And in this case, primarily had to do with stream temperature. Wood recruitment was modeled by source, adjacent riparian tree fall, as well as landslide and mass wasting events. Temperature sensitive stream reaches were also looked at. And in both cases, the aim was to determine if the riparian conservation strategy achieved the biological goals and objectives. 
So the modeling used the RCA buffer width, that's horizontal dis distances, ODF's forest inventory data grown forward over the permit term, random tree fall, uh, that's an assumption that we made was just random tree fall as opposed to directional tree fall. And all of this was calibrated to the 19, or the debris flow activity was calibrated to the 1996 flood event. <clears throat> so sedimentation specifically was not uh, modeled in this endeavor. Um, you know, we have designed these buffers and also the management direction and best management practices for our transportation network to both minimize sediment delivery um, and also uh, help ensure proper routing of sediment. But it was not specifically modeled. We did not build sediment budgets uh, for the permit area. The aquatic modeling results support the RCAs as an effective tool for both wood recruitment and temperature protection. Riparian conservation areas captured 99% of the available wood over the permit term. 88% of that wood was from standing trees in the type F buffers, or buffers along type F streams, the 120 foot. 12% of the total wood is recruited from debris flow activity. 45% of the non fish bearing streams. Uh, deliver wood to fish bearing streams, which really helps uh, support both the debris flow strategy uh, that we have, as well as the temperature protection zone on those small perennial type ends as an additional wood recruitment source. Temperature modeling uh, found uh, was conducted based on streams with a southerly aspect and a mass maximum channel width of 36 feet. Over the entire permit area, there are 67 stream miles that are considered susceptible to warming, which is only 0.85% of the total stream miles in the permit area. And those, uh, those stream miles are covered by a 120 foot buffer. So we believe that will function well to protect stream temperatures. Okay, next slide. The terrestrial conservation strategies uh, focus on increasing the quantity and quality of habitat over the permit term by building on areas of known species occurrence, current suitable habitat, and highly suitable habitat, and landscape connectivity. A combination of passive and active management will be used to protect and enhance habitat across the landscape. Okay, next slide. Habitat conservation areas have been drafted that protect active northern spotted owl activity centers, marble murrelet occupied habitat, and red tree vole nests. They include historic northern spotted owl activity centers with a consistent history of occupancy and reproduction. They also protect uh, certain uh, red tree bowl occurrences that we have found, although we do not, we have not yet uh, done systematic red tree bowl surveys like we have northern spotted owl and marble murrelet surveys. Um, basically, they result from some research activities that have happened on, on uh, ODF managed lands. As drafted, the HCAs incorporate the majority of suitable habitat for the covered terrestrial species especially northern spotted owls and marbled murrelets, as a result of our extensive survey efforts on those species that spans almost 30 years. Large swaths of forest ODF managers have lower suitability, but are incorporated to provide connectivity both across our own landscape and from adjacent federal lands. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a, a few minutes when we talk about the size distribution of habitat conservation areas. Next slide. 
management activities will occur inside of habitat conservation areas, as long as they are aligned with the biological goals and objectives. Passive management will play an important role and the HCP will allow for that active management that are aligned with the biological goals and objectives. And this is, in, this is an important distinction uh, for management outside the HCAs. Activities within the HCAs will not be economically driven, although positive volume and revenue gains may result from them. The impetus for management activities within the HCAs will be to increase the quantity and quality of habitat over the permit term. And I can't, I just, you know, want to make really clear that although there could be economic benefit from those activities, that's not the reason that they will be implemented. So the types of silvicultural treatments um, include density management to accelerate the development of large trees and canopy diversity, selective harvest with variable retention strategies to promote horizontal diversity and patch dynamics, and they could also be used to treat diseases such as laminated root rot. <clears throat> Management activities will even include regeneration harvest to treat stands with low potential to grow into habitat for covered species, such as stands that are infected with Swiss needle cast disease and hardwood stands that have little or no conifer components. All of these activities will be designed to minimize short-term negative effects on covered species while still achieving the long-term habitat development. The pace and scale of these activities within HCAs is still being determined, but many of the activities will occur in the permit term, earlier in the permit term, <clears throat> so habitat gains can be realized during the permit term. For instance, if we were going to address a severe Swiss needle cast problem, it would not make any sense to wait until the later in the permit term to do that when all you would see is perhaps a short-term negative effect and no uh, substantial habitat gain. Makes sense to do that earlier in the permit term so that the gains can be realized. Okay, next slide. So the exact boundaries of the HCAs are still being refined, and currently HCAs are expected to cover between 273,000 to 289,000 acres across the entire permit area. Biologists have defined 200 discrete HCAs across the landscape. The size varies based on the functional objective and ownership pattern in a particular area. For instance, some smaller HCAs are reflective of patchwork ownerships, where connectivity is a key objective, versus a very, a very few large HCAs are located with, um, where ODF is the only significant public landowner and has a great deal of known species occurrence. Generally speaking, smaller HCAs would be subjected to less management, whereas larger HCAs coincide with the previously mentioned forest health concerns and will likely see more management activity. As you can see from this histogram here at the bottom of the slide, uh, most of, about half of the HCAs fall into a range of 100 to 500 acres, and there are very few over 10,000 acres or between 5 and 10,000 acres. <clears throat> Across the permit area, we've divided it into three geographic subregions, and uh, Brian will talk about this a little bit more when he gets into the uh, uh, forest management modeling later in the presentation. But in our North Coast area, which comprise our Astoria, Tillamook, and Forest Grove districts, we have between 214,000 to 226 acres that we think will fall in the HCAs. In the Willamette Valley, Subgeographic region, which is North Cascade and Western Oregon District, it will be 34,000 to 36,000. And then our Southern Oregon State Forests, which include our Veneta Unit, Coos Unit, and Southwest Unit, we're thinking it will be more like 25,000 to 27,000 acres. Okay, next slide. 
So ODF and ICF work to adapt existing published models for the northern spotted owl, marble murrelet, red tree vole, and Oregon slender salamander uh, to adapt those to ODF's forest inventory data in order to characterize current condition and future outcomes for, four, uh, for those four species. The models were then reviewed by their original authors who were accepting of how the models were adapted and offered some suggestions for improvement. Some of you as part of individual stakeholder group meetings have had additional detail on these models already uh, from our biologist, Nick Palazados. <clears throat> the results of habitat suitability were divided into general habitat categories, which generally included unsuitable, marginally suitable, low suitability, suitable, and highly suitable habitat. This modeling effort shows that habitat conservation areas incorporate almost all of the current highly suitable habitat and the majority of suitable habitat for northern spotted owls and marble murrelet. This is not surprising given our knowledge of those species occurrence that was key in designing the HCA. Far less is known about the occurrence and range of habitat suitability for red tree voles and Oregon slender salamander. Still, most of the highly suitable habitat for both species is captured within HCAs, as well as most of the suitable model habitat for red tree voles and about 40 to 43 percent of Oregon slender salamander suitable habitat. Next slide. So here's the combined estimated acres of habitat conservation area and riparian conservation area, which comprise 49 to 52% of the permit area overall. It's important to note that strategies are complementary to one another. Riparian conservation areas for small perennial non-fish streams are important for Columbia and Cascade torrent salamanders. Streams with a high proportion of habitat conservation area will also benefit um, from less intensive pace and scale of management that will provide additional protection from overall thermal loading and summer low flows. So there are landscape level and localized effects to the conservation strategies. About 12% of the permit area uh, is in, I'm sorry, that should say RCAs and um, about 46% of those RCAs are also within HCAs. So the total combined HCA and RCA acres rounded to the nearest thousand are for the entire permit area, 315,000 to 331,000 acres. For the North Coast, 250,000 to 261,000 acres. For the Willamette Valley, 38,000 to 41,000 acres, and for Southern Oregon, 27,000 to 29,000 acres. And so that concludes the summary of the riparian conservation areas and habitat conservation areas. Are there any questions on those? And Mike, as we look for the hands coming up, do you want to tell people, like, do you have a lot? This is your full presentation, right, for this section? I just want to double check that. That's correct. Yes. Okay, good. Because it just helps people kind of know this is, the hope was trying to make the presentation high enough level to get some good understanding, but give you some deep dive. And so we left a lot of time for questions. We have about 50 minutes, if I have this correct, right? So at least a good solid 45 minutes or so for questions um, before we move on to the, um, the modeling topic. And so what I'm going to do is as hands come up, I'm going to try to say your name correctly. And I apologize if I don't pronounce it correctly. But I would ask as you start speaking, please say your first and last name. And if you happen to have an affiliation, go ahead and say that too. And if folks could stay on mute until it's your turn and then take yourself off mute when it's your time to speak. And then remember to go back on mute afterwards. All right, so Heath Curtis, we saw your hand come up first. Go ahead. Mike, uh, are you going to separately categorize later the, or catalog for us later the 
roads and other inoperable acres that would be in addition to this 315 to 331,000 acres? Yes, we will. And that will come out of some of the forest modeling uh, that we're doing. Uh, basically, we know we do have some inoperable acres that are outside of the habitat conservation areas. And what we'll, some of that will show up in the results of the forest modeling. And Brian will talk more about it in a minute. But basically, um, you know, out of the forest modeling, we're not just talking about volume numbers that come out of that. We're going to have suitable habitat acres that come out of it as well. And that's both inside and outside the HCAs. And that will allow the services to do their effects analysis then across the entire uh, landscape. Uh, to under, have a better understand us too, to have a better understanding of what that intervening non-HCA landscape uh, will look like. And so that will be in, important both for HCP and for later forest management plan uh, modeling as well. Thank you for that, Heath. And then Bob? Are you off mute, Bob? There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. We can hear you now. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for this, Mike. I had a question about the wood recruitment numbers. You had a 99% wood recruitment number. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more how, about how that was calculated, um, because that seems high given the buffers. I think it said 99% of available wood. So that's my question. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll do my best. I'm no Dan Miller, I'll tell you that. But um, basically, th it was done using ODF's forest inventory as grown forward. And so it is uh, talking about the, avail uh, the available wood over the permit term uh, versus, say, uh, you know, a site potential tree which is also often used. And we really wanted to make the analysis relevant to what we were going to be doing over the next 70 years. Now, there are a lot of assumptions around that in terms of like, especially around debris flows, uh, you know, in terms of their frequency and, and such as that, um, that I am really not, you know, I won't even take a stab at here today trying to trying to speak to. Um, but that is what we are getting such a high percentage of. Now, if you were to compare it under a set of different assumptions, um, and I know that different assumptions have been made under other processes that I'm really not qualified to speak to, um, that you would probably get different results um, out of that. Although I would suspect that the, even if it was not a 99%, in some other scenarios, it would still be relatively high. And I don't know if Troy, perhaps you wanted to add some into that because you're aware of more of what's going on beyond ODF than I am. Yeah, I think the <clears throat> thanks, Bob, for the question. I mean, you know, when we when we first saw the results, we had the same reaction. We we all thought that's high. Talked with you know Dan Miller and Lee Binda about it. They agreed. I think the main um, the main reason for that, at least as far as we can tell, is is most of the woods coming from you know uh, adjacent to type F streams. We have the 120 foot buffers on those streams, but you know again that's uh, that's horizontal distance. So when you you know in a lot of places you know think about the majority of the permit area being on the north coast, a lot of that area is relatively steep. And so 120 foot buffer becomes something bigger uh, using horizontal, dif horizontal distance, you know, 130, 140 feet, maybe even 150 feet. And so we end up with some pretty, you know, some, some decent sized buffers on a lot of those streams for a large part of the permit area. And I think the result is we're, we're getting a lot of that wood or nearly all of it. Um, we, you know, we've had subsequent conversations with uh, with the train works folks about that and kind of run through the uh, the various assumptions, as Mike noted, that have gone into that. And, uh, you know, I think they're all they're all sound and all in alignment with 
sort of best practices related to you know, wood modeling that has that has happened um, in other uh, in, you know, sort of other venues recently, and it is kind of an evolving science, but I think it's, it's sort of using best practices. So um, it's what the you know it's, it's what the data show at this point in time, and I think it's it's uh, fairly sound. That help, Bob? Were you just still saying something, Bob? We can't actually hear you if you are. No, back on mute. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, some folks have let me know, Chad Washington, that you had a hand up. Okay. Did you want to go ahead? Um, sure. This is Chad Washington with Lewis and Clark Timberlands. I had a question about the uh, distribution of the HCAs. It appears that 80% of the HCAs are found on the North Coast, and that's six times the, the next closest area. Is that proportional to ownership, or has it just been identified that the habitat is superior on the North Coast and I guess I could use some explanation as to why 80% of that occurs in the North Coast. Sure, and it is, um, it is pretty proportional. Um, for instance, those, the numbers I gave you um, work out to be on the North Coast about 50 to 52% of, of that area. Um, the Willamette Valley actually has a little less, 45 to 48%. Mm -hmm. uh, of that in HCAs, uh, and that, uh, the numbers I'm giving you here are the uh, combination of HCA and RCA mm -hmm. total. Um, and then uh, in the south, uh, is our southern districts, it's 51 to 54 percent. Mm -hmm. A lot of that reflects known TME occurrence. Uh, we do have some, you know, both current and um, significant historic uh, occurrence. Um, that landscape changes uh, considerably for us over the last um, couple of decades, um, but we still recognize the importance of a lot of those uh, habitat areas. The other thing that plays into that um, is being the only public ownership in that area um, and having to sort of provide for our own connectivity across uh, those areas as opposed to uh, having some federal support for habitat on that end. And, and we're talking about more than just uh, dispersal habitat. We're talking about, you know, areas that will have patches of, say, uh, intervening habitat that uh, of suitable habitat and highly suitable habitat that can be used uh, in, that, in that connectivity process. Um, and like I said, it's also in those areas where, you know, the vast majority of acres uh, are that uh, we will be looking to do most of our um, management. Uh, we do have, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, significant problems with Swiss Neem cast still um, up in that area. Um, and then we also have areas of large swaths of alder. Mm -hmm. And that alder is at an age where over the next couple of decades, it's going to senesce and it has no conifer understory to speak of in a lot of cases. And so it will turn into, you know, a pretty large brush field. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, early complex sterile habitat. However, in this case, trying to speak to the needs of the covered species, um, vast expanses of that isn't necessarily going to help. So while we're certainly not looking to eliminate the hardwood patch dynamic on the landscape or anything like that, um, you know, I mean, even our reforestation prescriptions will have alder in them. Mm -hmm. um, but we are, we are looking at those areas where that is clearly out of balance in doing some, you know, in, in doing various forms of regeneration, harvest of hardwoods, um, and restoring them to more of a conifer condition. Mm -hmm. That makes sense with the former Tillamook burn. I'm sure there's lots of large alder patches. And that kind of leads to my second question yeah. regarding alder. 
if in those RCAs, the basal area of conifer is less than half of the target, will you still be considering conversions to turn those RCAs back into a conifer cover type? In that case, we really are not considering doing that on any kind of a large scale under the HCP. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is you do run into a shade effect. You're removing shade, um, uh, potentially raising stream temperature. And so you have a problem there. Does, uh, the minimization strategy doesn't work as well um, around stream temperature. But the other piece that we have a problem with, uh, there's, you know, under our current management, um, we have the ability on paper to go in and manage in our RMAs. And that tends to be such a expensive operation, mm -hmm. and it has not borne us a lot of fruit over the years. And so rather than using that as a core part of our conservation strategy under the HCP, we're really looking at using that to uh, it would be very selective about when and where that occurred. And that would be one of those things where actually we would get together with NOAA fisheries at that point and say, okay, this seems like an appropriate place. And then have that discussion. Um, it's still within the context of the HCP, but it's not like a, a strategy that's um, laid out ahead of time. Yeah. So we don't, we really don't envision doing much of it at all. Okay, thanks. It seems like with the long-term plan of this plan that the longer lifespan of conifer large woody debris compared to alder debris in the streams would be a consideration. It is a consideration. I mean, I mean certainly alder melts pretty fast um, by comparison. Um, I think it's really the stand development over time that we're, that we're relying on and you know, especially in Tillamook, we have a significant amount of our wood that comes from debris flow that will come from upslope conditions that aren't quite the same. Although some of those are historically so dynamic, they have remained in alder conditions no matter, you know, with or without uh, human management over the centuries. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Chad. And um, next up is Noah Greenwald. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, holding this meeting and for taking my question. I had a question about the landslide initiation points. Um, first, in some cases, it's not necessarily a point. It's more of a polygon where you can have, you know, a really steep um, concave area that's, you know, likely to shed a landslide. So it's bigger than a point. And then also you can have, you know, with any debris flow channel, you can have kind of at the head or you can have little side splits where there's landslide initiation points on those as well. And so I'm wondering if you're, if the goal is to buffer the landslide initiation points so you avoid the known increase in landslides caused by clear cutting, or is it just to grab one of the initiation points or what, what's actually gonna be buffered in terms of landslide terrain? Yeah, thanks, Noah. Um, that's a good point to to clarify. Um, you know what we refer to as you know an initiation point or a potential initiation point actually is you know it is some area. Uh, sometimes it is a single area of you know of varying size, and sometimes it is multiple areas. The intention is to grab and buffer everything that is part of that potential failure. Um, and that will be, uh, you know, for the modeling exercise, um, it's a fairly limited area, you know, done from a DEM. And it is a modeled product, so it's an estimate of how much is out there that can contribute. It isn't pinpointing everything for us. Uh, so in reality, um, it's still a site-specific assessment uh, by our geotechnical staff to be able to go out and identify all of the areas in that head wall that contribute to that potential failure and, and uh, buffering that out as part of that debris flow track capturing that entire area. And, and Deb and Mike, if I could add, this is Troy with ICF again real quick. I think that's an, just generally a, an important point um, to add there about 
how how this will all happen during implementation and that is that you know we obviously showed the graphics on the screen today and it all looks neat and tidy we know that it's not like that all the time on the landscape but um you know when ahead of similar to what happens now i mean ahead of uh, timber sales and other activities there will be you know people geotech etc on the ground uh, mapping out those features that then dictate what the buffering strategies will be so it's not just a gis exercise it really is you know people out looking and making determinations about into fish into perenniality the initiation points as mike just pointed out so there is um, you know a fairly rigorous process um, outlined during implementation that will be very beneficial And I, I guess I'll pile on to that just a little bit, Troy. Thank you. Um, you know, what we showed today was not every single bit of how things are delineated on the landscape. I mean, we will also be continuing to protect inner gorge areas by buffering out to the extent of the inner gorge where it, where it bows outside of the uh, riparian conservation area. We'll be, you know, making sure that we capture those features. Um, certain seeps and springs that are uh, stream associated, but the seeper spring is outside of the riparian conservation area buffer. We will continue to buffer those and, and incorporate them. Uh, imagine, if you will, it, the stream buffer bubbling out a little bit to, to capture them um, and that sort of thing as well. And that will all, of course, be detailed in the, in the draft HCP. We're just not presenting every little bit of it today. Great, thank you so much for the question and for the answers. So next up we have Dave Ivanoff, go ahead. Dave, are you maybe still on mute? There Sorry. you go. No Sorry, worries. Jeff. Yeah, we got you, go ahead. Uh, Mike, uh, with respect to the RCAs, I understood you to say there was going to be minimal harvest activity in that area. As it relates to the HCAs, what would be the, the harvest activity level in, in the HCAs? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, we are still determining the pace and scale of that. Um, a lot of that has to do with the forest modeling. We won't have a final uh, handle on that until we uh, run some of our, our <laughs> finals, an interesting word, because I don't see modeling ever stopping, but you know, our final models before we uh, put together the first administrative draft of, sorry, present in October. Um, I really think that uh, there will be a fairly significant amount of management, you know, in those areas with the forest health concerns. Um, that we're out, that we've talked about. There will also be, um, you know, density management. We have a lot of that area. We recognize going in that we have a lot of that area that is in young stands, um, and we may have, for instance, younger stands that are adjacent to marble millet management areas. And right now, when we go in there to thin those stands, not only for the stands not only for a forest health concern and increasing that stands vigor and the size of the trees there and all of that stuff, but also uh, in terms of, you know, basically to create a better buffer for that neural habitat. That in and of itself has, you know, some risk associated with it. Under an HCP, it will allow us to be a lot more planful about that type of activity and really be able to make good give us more flexibility to make uh, really good decisions about how to move stands forward. Now, I mean, that being said, uh, certainly the pace and scale of management inside of HCAs is gonna be far less than on the non-HCA landscape. And it's gonna follow non-traditional uh, sort of routes of silviculture. So if we have a perfectly good stand of suitable owl habitat, even if it's not occupied in an HCA, um, you know, and it's growing well and, and there's nothing to treat, we're not going to be going in there and doing anything to it. 
Um, these won't be economically driven decisions. They will be habitat driven decisions. But sometimes, you know, they're going to have uh, economic outputs that are favorable too. You know, I, th I think we shouldn't overlook the fact that some of these things are are still going to be a challenge when we look at Swiss needle cast areas and some of these older areas that we want to treat. You know, you know as well as I do, they don't always pay for themselves, and so uh, that. You know, figuring out how to accomplish that is also another another sort of issue that we have to wrestle with. Mike, one follow-up uh, question as well on the uh, the ranges that you provided for both the RCAs and the HCAs, and then in total, there's about a five percent differential from the low end to the high end. What drives that difference? What drives that difference is, is basically our operational review of these areas. So we have certain, we have an iterative process that's going on uh, with that, where we, we take the biological criteria that we use to design the HCAs, which are focused again on species occurrence and suitable habitat and connectivity. Um, and we have to balance those concerns with certain operational uh, issues, areas that are easier or harder for us to access and operate in and look at where there might be some reasonable adjustments to be made. And that was done, uh, you know, with a field review. But to be really, really clear, um, you know, the, the review that we asked the field to do on these areas um, was, was not a volume or revenue uh, review. That was not the objective. The objective was an operational review of where are we, you know, where are we potentially creating areas that could be difficult to manage through, um, or that we, you know, management was uh, anticipated because it's it's good ground and that sort of thing, but not because oh yeah we you know this is our area that we need our volume from or this is an area that's high net revenue or anything like that it was about the operational uh component of that and uh we're still ferreting that out um this is you know what what i showed today is is where we're at and where we think it is it's sort of this estimated sort of area and i don't want uh you know presenting to present it any other way um uh, and it really isn't, it isn't done yet. It will be somewhere in that neighborhood is, uh, is what I would say. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much for that. And um, Dave is with Hampton Lumber, just remember with affiliations and then Seth Barnes, you're up next, go ahead. Yeah, Dave pretty much hit on my question. I was going to ask that. So maybe I'll ask a nuance of it. Just, just uh, you said that uh, I think I look, I, I tried to remember back to your, your slides, but I don't remember, the, I don't know that it was on your slides. I think you did say, as Dave mentioned, that the riparian buffers would have minimal to no management within them. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? And uh, is there any, uh, is there, is there any management in those areas anywhere or is it just a, a, a uh, hard line. For all intents and purposes, uh, you know, the, for the core of the uh, riparian conservation strategy, there isn't management in those areas. We are staying out of those riparian conservation areas. Uh, now, like I said, there could be exceptions to those. And the two main exceptions I can see is where you know, if there is an area where it appears like the investment is worthwhile, uh, that might be successful uh, in restoring a mature forest uh, condition there, a conifer-based condition, then okay, we, you know, that might be something that we uh, pursue, but we would be pursuing it basically in, in, uh, by conferring with NOAA Fisheries under the umbrella of the HCP, but it's not something that we're laying out the uh, prescription for now or any expectation that we would actually be doing uh, a significant amount of that. So, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't count on that type of, of management activity. The other type is our stream restoration activities specifically. Um, 
where you, you know there may be some sort of impact to uh, to the adjacent riparian area and also have an effect of perhaps removing shade for a time or something like that that would be in the same the same vein though it would be something that we would uh, work with NOAA fisheries on uh, and not not something that we are prescribing in the HCP. Just kind of pausing to see if anybody else has questions. Sometimes I miss the hands going up, so it's okay if anybody wants to help me. It looks like Heath Curtis, did your hand just go up? Yes, and then Doug Cooper, and then we'll go back to Bob Van Dyke if there's not others. Okay, Heath, go ahead. Yeah, and I just, again, Mike, you may be covering this later. It wasn't, wasn't clear to me. I mean, it would be helpful to have a feel for, in addition to this, you know, 51% that may be caught up in HTAs and RCAs, what additional fraction of the forest would be encumbered by, you know, roads and inoperable acres and these uh, inner gorges and seeps and springs? Are we going to get a catalog of those percentages as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. And they'll be put out with the modeling results, uh, which is important. Yeah, you know, we, we, over time, we have done a better job of, as our modeling has evolved over the last 20 years, we've really done a better job of trying to estimate uh, the amount of inner gorge and the amount of other things. Seeps and springs are a little bit of a, uh, those aren't really estimated. Um, but inner gorges, you know, some of the bigger rocks, uh, high landslide uh, hazard locations and things like that. So we will be detailing uh, those as well. But we, today, not today, not today. No. I see that as being part of a, the sort of the final package of modeling that we wrap up uh, to present uh, in in October, as because we're not. And even then, um, not to steal too much of Brian's thunder later on, but we will be. Um, you know, we are still mo modeling this at a policy level, and certainly that has implications for implementation. But, uh, you know, the modeling will continue to drill down and get more refined uh, as time goes on. Yeah, just a, it informs financial viability, of course. Yes, absolutely. All right, thanks so much, Heath. So, Doug Cooper, go ahead. Oh yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, maybe just piling on the the details a little bit, transparency. So I was interested if uh, today you'll be able to identify, uh, maybe it's in the forest modeling, uh, how many acres of the Swiss needle cast non-productive, you know, it's been reported over 100,000 acres, right? So how many of those acres are within the habitat conservation areas? I don't have that number for you. Um... I don't have that number for you today, Doug. I, I can get that to you, however, uh, to the group, whatever the process is for distributing that stuff after the meeting. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And then I'm next going to call on Bob Van Dyke again, but I want to encourage if anybody from recreation community or the counties or anybody else from conservation and industry um, want to jump in, feel free. Um, I want to also note that we have a, board, a forestry member with us here, Brenda McComb, and um, recognize and thank any of the other folks that are here appointed or elected. And um, also members of the, I forgot to mention at the very beginning, it's called the steering committee and scoping team, which are part of the um, project work effort. So lots of great people on the call and I'll call on Bob right now, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, just brief, this is Bob Van Dyke, Walt Sam Center. I'm briefly interested in uh, hearing when we will actually get to see some maps. I'm sorry if I missed that. I know you're working on this stuff still, and I'm sure they'd still be in draft form, but I know my community will be interested in actually seeing where that habitat conservation areas are. So process-wise, we are still, um, uh, you know, working the final, uh, final configuration of these. Uh, and then able to incorporate them into the modeling. 
and so once that package is is ready to go, and I believe, um, actually, I'll probably get it wrong, and so I'll ask uh, uh, Troy <laughs> to step in. It'll be before the October board meeting, of course. Um, I'm thinking it's somewhere in the September range, but Troy can help confirm that. For me. That's correct. Yeah, um, there'll, there'll be another uh, meeting open to the public in the September time frame, and there'll be more details on maps and other information, as you mentioned, at that time. So ahead of the Board of Forestry meeting um, in October. That's great. Early September would be great because I think the board meeting is early October, maybe October 5th or 6th. So, um, yeah. anyway, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and you're right on those dates, Bob. Thanks for that. Um, anybody else? Hands up. Anybody else want to jump in with questions? Commissioner Sullivan, feel free. Go ahead. Oh, I saw a hand go up. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Welcome. Hi, I'm so happy that you're having this uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess one of the questions that came to me was, you know, we've been in a moderate drought on the North Coast and with climate change. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the streams and the seeps and seasonal, non-seasonal? Um, how do you, I don't know how to ask this, but um, it seems like there's going to be changes over the landscape as time goes on. And how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, certainly there, there will be. Thank you. And so our, yeah, so certainly there, there will be changes. Thank you uh, for that. And, you know, uh, there's a couple of different ways that we handle this. One is up front in the strategy. We believe it's robust enough to be resilient um, in the face of climate change, uh, not only in the riparian conservation areas themselves, but also uh, in the, the fact that the habitat conservation areas are large and, you know, the pace and scale of management in there will be uh, different. And of course, there's a lot of effects, uh, upland effects, um, you know, that translate into, into downstream effects that way. So we, we think that, number one, we are providing an appropriate amount of resilience for both terrestrial and aquatic habitats. The other piece uh, comes in the adaptive management approach um, to the HCP. We are still working on that chapter and we're not really presenting on it today. Um, and actually, I guess what I'll do is I'll tag Troy again um, on that. But just uh, before he says anything, you know, basically we will have adaptive management and monitoring in place under the HCP, both compliance monitoring and effectiveness monitoring that will allow us to, uh, and also under our FMP as well, not to forget, but to allow us to uh, adapt to that sort of changing environment. But uh, Troy. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I agree. And I, and I think the important point there is um, sort of loops back to what I said a little bit ago. And that is that, you know, as much as we are striving to design, you know, resilient strategies, as Mike noted, um, we also will be leaning heavily on the implementation process and what happens on the ground. And we know that, you know, 10, 20, 50 years from now, things are going to look different out there. The strategy will be the same, but what's identified on the landscape by sort of the boots on the ground effort will be different. And so we, we will rely on that, um, you know, kind of hands-on analysis, um, you know, sort of timber sale by timber sale to continue to feed information back into the, into the program. Then if at some point in time, you know, down the road, it turn, you know, we're finding that for whatever reason, the strategy isn't functioning like we thought it would. We're not getting the results that we thought we would get. We're not achieving the biological objectives that we have set. Uh, we're, or we're, we're not making progress towards them. Um, that is where the adaptive management program comes in and we, we would make adjustments at that point in time. So it's hard to, you know, it, uh, as much as we uh, try to, you know, model the stuff out and plan for the inevitable, 
uh, we know that it'll be different than what we anticipate. And so we rely more heavily on process at that point in time uh, and leave some flexibility so that some changes can be made in the future in response to that, uh, that monitoring and that implementation effort. So um, I think uh, probably again, looking towards uh, the September timeframe, more information on what that implementation looks like, what the monitoring and adaptive management program looks like. Um, and so um, a better understanding of, of the processes and kind of the checks and balances that will be in place during implementation to, um, to help with, with some of those uncertainties. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the work that you all are doing on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I also wanted to note that we have a number of tribes with us on the call and thank you for being a part of this conversation and for being here and please feel free to speak up. We'd love to hear your voice too during these questions and during the group discussion. So welcome. Um, I currently have up Chad Washington and then to Mary Skurlock. Hello. So um, I know today's conversation is around this HCP and these HCAs. And one of my questions is one of the benefits of having an HCP that is clearly not focused on economic activities to allow for activities that are focused on economics in the non HC areas so that we can continue to support and promote a vibrant forest products industry here in Oregon. Yes. I mean, is that, uh, so the balance of those things clearly, um, our production, uh, and I shouldn't use that, uh, I use words of convenience here, our non-HCA areas will be more focused on production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we are still looking at the modeling, uh, both by geographic region, and, and Brian can get more into this, and I probably should defer a fair bit of this to Brian, mm -hmm. but we are certainly, um, you know, looking at both the distribution uh, in terms of our sub-geographic areas of, of where the harvest would take place, um, how, you know, what those outcomes would, would look like, as well as what the intervening landscape, um, that non-HCA landscape, what we want it to look like and where that really takes the harvest patterns um, to see, you know, because there's, there's questions there not only around the amount harvested, but what are the products uh, that we're going to produce? over the long term. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, would it be a product shift for us? Um, you know, or will it look kind of the same in terms of what we produce? Um, it's all, all good questions. I, I don't uh, have an answer for that yet though, today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just in the, in the spirit of transparency, and we were talking about certainty, and with regards to HCP, the conservation certainty and being able to count on those areas being managed for conservation um, you know, operational certainty is also quite important to a lot of us on, on this call. And so if the agreement is that these areas are to be focused on for conservation, it would be nice to have the, the flip side of that be true as well and have more certainty about the ability to operate in the non-HCA areas. Oh, absolutely. And that's, you know, that is the entire reason uh, for getting an HCP is that planning certainty on both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, quite frankly, with an HCP, you get an incidental take permit. And a lot of the incidental take over time, over the permit time horizon, would be habitat that grows in a non-HCA portion of the landscape that, you know, you will be able to harvest, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the uncertainty of take avoidance where you've made a conservation commitment uh, but then, you know, oh, are you going to also end up with another conservation commitment because somebody happens to move in over here and not having any, any way out of that uh, sort of haphazard mm -hmm. uh, scenario? Well, I appreciate your efforts to balance a 12-sided teeter-totter. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chad. So, Mary Skurlock, you're up. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Thank you. Um, also appreciate the information today, thank you. Um, I just had a quick follow-up question on the comment that was made about um, 
specifics around the third component of the aquatic strategy, which is restoration activities. I understood you to say that we will not be seeing specific prescriptions for site-specific restoration in the HCP because these would be worked out in conference, but I'm trying to get a better sense of what this component does include. Um, because I, I guess I'm gathering there are no expectations set in terms of acres or stream miles treated. Um, but, you know, is what, do, what, what is the framework for potentially allowable restoration? Is it all couched in terms of objectives related to the functions that you laid out? In other words, wood temperature and sediment, or are there other potential restoration objectives? There are other potential restoration objectives, um, and I think Troy wants to probably list them for you. Uh, but you know, yeah, no, certainly um, there there are uh, you know, for instance, fish passage issues would be one. Um, there may be areas where we we don't have an operation to take that we could uh, you know typically we typically do our va road vacating. Um, uh, decommissioning type activities associated with with operations when we can it's opportunistic and we're looking at ways to make that more planful under the HCP and certainly there will be a list of how uh, the mechanism by which we prioritize activities will be laid out under the HCP and the HCP also will um, uh, basically have a mechanism in there that we know that we'll be able to provide uh, funding for those type of activities. So right now we do a lot of work associated with, quite frankly, associated with the timber sale, like when we can, when we can pay for it, when, we, when we'll be in the area. And we're looking at ways in the HCA, HCP to make it uh, a little more planful. And Troy, is there some, you can give some more detail on, on that? I think that you pretty much covered it. The only thing I would add is that, um, you know, like, like everything, Thing that is in the HCP, um, it, the the any restoration activity that occurs, it, it will be you know um, sort of in service of the biological objective. So we will be doing restoration projects that um, you know deal with in-stream habitat structure, wood enhancement, uh, this, anything that might help with um, with uh, you know water quality, water flow over time, fish passage. So you know we probably won't. We're not going to see anything that's outside of the bounds of the biological objectives. And we know that any given project actually can accomplish or, or contribute to any any number of those things at one time. Um, I think the the real um, you know the way that it's it's likely to work out is that the the funding will be there, as, as Mike mentioned. And then it will be just a matter of where, uh, you know, where within the permit area do those restoration activities um, need to occur. And there needs to be uh, some, some connectivity there, just from a permitting perspective, some connectivity there between the benefits you get from the restoration actions um, and, you know, uh, the, the benefits that, you, that the covered species get from the restoration actions um, relative to kind of where the effects are occurring on the landscape. And so, you know, I guess that's one way of saying that I would imagine most of the restoration activity would be on the North Coast where we have most of the permit area, most of the land ownership. There would still need to be some restoration activity, um, you know, throughout the rest of the permit area, but it would probably be more targeted and limited um, as you have more of a scattered land ownership. And I think that's, that makes sense. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the, the HCP will treat all of this kind of at a program level. So we have, as Mike mentioned, um, identified limiting factors on the covered fish species, for example, what restoration actions would be beneficial, and then, um, you know, criteria that could be used by ODF to select uh, if and when a restoration project should move forward. And then um, I think the way the relationship would probably work is that most of the time it would probably be other entities executing those restoration activities. ODF would be providing uh, funding and, you know, support in various ways. Um, and then, you know, like everything else, all of that then gets kind of looped into the, um, the monitoring uh, process over time. Are those functioning as we think that they should function? Are they providing the benefits that we're getting? And they'll be part of the annual reporting process. So you, everybody will always know how many restoration projects went in the ground this year? What were they? Where were they? Um, and then over time, are they performing adequately? 
Thanks. So, so, get, so over over um, at the at the get go of the permit, though, are you going to set some kind of expectations for um, the level of restoration activities that will occur? There will be a, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. There, there will be, um, there will be an expectation set for the level of restoration activities that occur, but we won't be specifically identifying restoration projects or locations that will occur. Does that make sense? So how does, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is how you assess, you know, the conservation, how does it connect to the, to the permit and the conservation benefit and you know the avoidance of jeopardy is restoration used in some way as mitigation for some other activity or is it just icing on the cake i guess it's kind of what i'm thinking yeah that's a really good point i mean in many ways so often it is used as sort of part of the mitigation package i would say in this case based on where we you know where we've ended up on the riparian strategy as mike just described today you know it's a little bit of icing on the cake um uh, but I, I do think that there are elements of our bi biological objectives that, um, you know, we're not, over the course of a 70 year permit term, we're not going to fully realize the benefits necessarily from some of that. So I think restoration can fill the gap. So thinking about just wood recruitment as the easy example, we know that the riparian strategy is going to get us, you know, um, nearly all of the wood that could be recruited into the system over the permit term. We also know that there are certainly benefits from doing wood enhancement projects you know, now, right? And so I think that um, while it is a little bit of icing on the cake for this particular HCP effort, there's certainly going to be benefits to the cover species in the short term from some some of those, you know, restoration activities. Sure. Okay. And it's really, I think, going to be centered on what are the, what are the known limiting factors, and that goes beyond this HCP, but, you know, there's um, many analyses out there sort of identify what are the limiting factors for the covered species and given watersheds, et cetera. And, and we would be, you know, targeting restoration activities that would address those limiting factors. And what's the big one and there are others. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mary, before you go back on mute, could you share your affiliation with people? Uh, yeah, I am the Oregon Stream Protection Coalition and also a sort of independent consultant. Great, great. Glad to have you with us and thank you. So it looks like we have time. We have about two, three minutes left. I want to mention in the comment in the chat area, um, ODF lets you know how you can submit written questions. So if for whatever reason you prefer that way, they can go into Jason Cox ODF and it has his email address. And here on the call right now, it looks like I'm going to try to squeeze in these last two. We have Mark Kajala and we also have Ian Ferguson. So go ahead, Mark. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm a Clatsop County Commissioner and I'm, this is great. This, I'm getting very good education. <laughs> this is getting a, a lot of, uh, of stuff as you're talking on a higher level than I'm used to, but I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to kind of learn more. I come from the perspective that, you know, we have essential services in Clatsop County that are funded by Timber Harvest. And I appreciated that what uh, Mr. Washington had to say, how much this impacts our community. So that's, that's really how I'm looking. At this is, is how is this going to affect you know jobs in our area how's this going to affect um, you know our tax base and, and our community moving forward so I'll be watching um, uh, with a great interest as we kind of uh, we uh, kind of weave through those uh, those things and, and uh, thanks again thank you thank you commissioner so glad to have you with us today and Ian Ferguson Like you're off mute, but we can't hear you. Ian, do you think you're double muted perhaps? See the hand up. We'll give Ian a second and see if there's anybody else that wanted to raise their hand or speak. Oh, was that you, Ian? What? There you go. Yeah. Nope. That that made me so while while Ian is uh, figuring that out, I'm not actually showing an audio connection for him in my participant list. But um, uh, back to uh, I believe it was Doug Cooper that asked about the Swiss Doodle Cast Acres. Um, we have about a hundred, a little less than 120,000 acres that we've identified, 
and um, about 46,000 of those acres are inside the HCAs, and about 97,000 acres of those, or I'm sorry, no, 73,000 acres of those are outside the HCAs. All right, so thank you for sharing that, Mike. I don't see Ian up there anymore. Maybe he lost a connection. Um, I think, you know, we'll watch to see if he comes back, but um, he said his phone cut out because I asked. So we'll see if he comes back, but I think otherwise we can move on at this point and we can always catch his question later on in the open session, if that's all right, okay? So um, if I'm just watching to see if he comes back right now, we'd let him jump in. But if not, let's keep going. And so Brian Pugh, um, I think you're helping us kick off the next section. Policy level forest management modeling is where we're at. A lot of content and information there and a lot to go through. So um, good afternoon, folks. I'm Brian Pugh, the Deputy of Policy for the State Forest Division. You know, it's really nice to be here today. We've been working on this project for a couple of years and to be at this point where we're showing you some draft um, strategies and some draft expected outcomes is, is really exciting. And definitely want to thank you all. I've been watching and there's still over 100 people on the call, so that's good. We're a couple hours in and, and lots of good engagement and questions in that last section. So I appreciate the participation and, and the thoughtful questions and comments for sure. So I'm going to walk you through, I think I've got about five slides here, so not nearly as much content as Mike, but we'll walk through about five slides in the next uh, 30 minutes. Plenty of time for questions, um, just like we did. So we'll save those for the end. Really want to characterize um, what we've all been saying, but this is a work in progress. We we wanted to show you the most up-to-date information. We we're hearing from you. You wanted to hear where we're at and, and see what we're doing. And so this very much is a work in progress um, and will change. And I'll walk through how things will change in the modeling uh, at the last couple of slides there. So with that, Troy, if you could advance to the next slide, that'd be great. So just as a kind of a overview of not the technicalities of the modeling, but what it's used for. And it's really being used to support decision-making by ODF staff. Um, and then ultimately the Board of Forestry in a couple of ways. And that first way will be for the board's decision-making in October of whether we go into the NEPA process or not. And the board will look at the information and decide whether to go, no go into the NEPA process. And so we're using this modeling, you know, in that way to really test and refine concepts and approaches and strategies. You know, and those concepts and strategies are both for the benefit of the species and, and how to manage the forest outside the HCAs and how it all connects together. You know, there is enough detail in the model to understand uh, the anticipated outcomes of the HCP, but this is, you know, we call it policy level modeling. You could call it high level modeling, um, kind of a planning modeling, if you will. There's a couple different terms you could use. And really, um, it's not that detailed operational modeling. We'll get to that in the future, but for right now, it is a higher level policy level modeling to inform decision making and outcomes. The model is set up to have a full range of greatest permit value outcomes. And so it does consider um, volume to local communities and volume to support jobs and revenue to the counties. And also our rec folks are looking at um, how the harvesting occurs and affects the recreation activities like camping, fishing, hiking, and a lot of other things. And so we really are truly looking at the whole forest here knowing we are you know developing an hcp but we've got to have the full force of mind that modeling helps us do that we're not using the modeling specifically to set harvest levels we don't have you know volume is an outcome of the model it's not a specific goal of the model but it is definitely an important outcome of the model that helps us achieve greatest permanent value 
Another piece that it's really going to inform in the HCP development is this modeling affects, um, informs the effects analysis on the species. And so through time, the timber harvest modeling, the management modeling helps us understand how the forest grows as we harvest it. And that when we look at that, we can tell the effects on the species, the quality of the habitat and the quantity over time. And then another important piece, uh, Mike spoke to it earlier, but we're really modeling across all ODF managed lands in the permit area. And then we're reporting out by these sub-geographic areas. And these sub-geographic areas being the North Coast, um, the districts of Astoria, Clatsop State Forest and the Tillamook State Forest. And then we've got the Willamette Valley, which is our North Cascades and West Oregon districts. And then we've got our Southern Oregon uh, area, which is Veneta all the way down to the California border. And when we look at those regions, there's a couple of things that we have in mind um, and how we got to those, you know, three kind of sub-geographic groupings. We definitely look at ODF staff and often we transfer staff between offices in those regions. They're short enough drives we can help each other out and help get the work done and meet the priorities of the division. We are also looking at our mill customers and there's definitely no customers in those three regions. And we looked um, when we were doing the model on it, historically how much state force wood went into those mills in those regions. We also grouped them in the species, the covered species, um, grouped up nicely that way too. And then also with the counties where we have um, a lot of counties that are business, with, we have that business relationship with, and we looked on how the effects would have on those too. So that's what we're looking at on those. You know, and it is important to note that this modeling will change. And so these are not the final numbers. Um, they're accurate enough at this point in the process to inform the process, to inform the effects analysis, to inform the configurations of the HCAs. And they will be, um, there will be one more modeling iteration. So we'll do another model iteration later in the summer. And after that, it will be um, accurate enough to inform Board of Forestry decision making. And so again, what I'm trying to say is the modeling isn't giving us the perfect answer, but it's one set of information we are using on the project, on the development, and with these big policy decisions that are in front of the board. Troy, looking at my notes, I think I covered that one. We'll go to the next slide, please. So I jumped ahead of myself a little bit on that last one, but we are looking at these um, five important things. There's other things, but these are five really important things that we're looking at when we look at the model results, when we say we're analyzing the model results. Uh, the timber harvest volume. You know, we're talking about a 70 year permit here. And so through time, through that 70 years, we don't plan uh, to have a flat timber harvest, to have a static timber harvest through that time. What we plan to do is have um, a departure from even flow. And so there'll be a range of volumes over the permit terms. Those range of volumes will be set in our implementation plan levels. And that range, those plans are 10 year plans, as some of you know, and engage us with on the development of those and so through time the timber harvest will flow up and down again that change in flow will help um, meet the goals of the species and help provide the other benefits such as volume and other elements of greatest permit value um, for that another thing we're looking at closely is the revenue generated of course um, that revenue funds the division. It helps ODF cover all forest management costs, including the cost of the implementation plan. Ultimately, 64% of the harvest revenue is generated, or is, that's generated, is distributed to the county. So that 64% majority is distributed to the counties, and we're looking at that too. We're looking at the forest inventory over time. And so how Oregon's forests look through time and through that 70 year period and those benefits that it provides for clean air and clean water and definitely the benefits to the species and other things. And so looking at that inventory, 
An important one for the HCP development is obviously the covered species, the habitat, the quality of the, that covered species, and the quantity of it. And we look at that at the starting point today, but also um, through time, every five years, we're looking at it to understand how the species benefit um, to the quality and quantity of the habitat. And then another important topic in Oregon is uh, carbon storage, and we want to understand state force role in carbon storage, what we contribute, if you will, in carbon storage under the different um, plans that we are considering. We do not have plans to sell carbon at this time or have any carbon project, but we still want to understand how um, state force plays a role in carbon storage in Oregon. That's important to the board, and, and we're looking at that closely. Uh, can you switch to the next slide, Troy? So here we see our anticipated outcomes for timber harvest, um, specific to those numbers. And again, this is the average number of the 70-year permit term. And um, there's a range there, similar to what Mike was showing on his HTA acres, but there is a range there. We do expect that average to fluctuate. Like I said, um, in certain decades, it'll be up and down, and those fluctuations could be a lot, as much as 20% of these averages. And so through time, it will change, varying by decade. And then again, those actual harvest levels will be set in the implementation plans, and that'll be um, developed uh, post-HGP. And so really, when we go to the the application to the services, they are not permitting the harvest level. They're definitely permitting the habitat and looking at that habitat and how it's affected on the species, but they are not permitting a um, certain harvest level for the 70 years. And so as we look at the numbers and we think about them, I've got to say it again, and you'll continue to hear Mike and I say it, is that the modeling numbers will continue to change as we refine and get more information and get more into it. The next uh, big change that we're seeing or would be finalizing the HCA configurations and then some additional refinements uh, to the forest modeling. And so we've got that planned for later this summer. That last model run there, um, the last one before we go to the board in October will be the one that informs the board. So the numbers you're seeing today are not necessarily the numbers we'll be taking to the board in October. And we should have those numbers out um, by the September timeframe. Um, Bob Van Dyke was asking about maps. We should have more firm numbers there too um, in that September meeting. So that's what I had there, and again, um, I should have referenced the, we got some numbers here, and I didn't reference these, these are 1,000 board feet. Um, and so when we look at that, we just recognize that these are 1,000 board feet averages on that. So my next slide there is for questions, and I see we've got people with hands raised, and so looking at my notes but yeah i think yeah. i'm ready to go to questions yeah thanks so much brian so we have about 15 minutes for questions and um commissioner thompson do you want to go first and you wrote us a question in the chat box do you want to just say it or do you want me to read it go ahead well uh it's a familiar question uh to <laughs> to brian because i raise it at every opportunity i you know you've got three Clatsop county commissioners here anna Commissioner elect, you are a hot topic on our agenda. I mean, we're really family with you. So thanks for uh, welcoming us. You know, I keep talking about mass timber technology. I want a healthy planet. I want a healthy economy. I look at how do we do that. It seems to me we make automation our friend and do mass timber. Um, all over Oregon to the extent that that's possible because what we're doing is increasing the value of our forest products to you know we got a better community tax base better community um, wages we've got a happier industry we've got fuller coffers i'm just going to keep asking you and asking you 
how is the Department of Forestry working with your state and local partners to support mass timber technology? Thank you, Leanne. You have asked me several times. We are really focused, and I probably haven't given you a good answer, so I can connect with you afterwards for sure. You said one of that the things last to time, is, Brian. <laughs> Just saying. One of the things to note is we are, from a business sense, looking at the next 70 years, and we know technology will change over 70 years. We're trying to provide in this HCPA permit. Um, certainly for the species, but certainly for our business. And so we have been um, talking with our mill customers and trying to understand their products and also understand the future. And clearly, uh, Leanne, understanding the future is best timber and, and providing those materials because we have to, we know as ODF, our mill customers are important. We have to provide a product that they would want to buy that that there's a market for for sure and so we are taking that in consideration on how we for um manage the forest outside there and so mike was talking about inside those hcas when we manage it's definitely for the species outside the hcas um, we're managing definitely for wood products and so we can support those local mills we did look closely in those three um, sub-geographic regions of what mill customers we have there today. And we expect over time they'll change, but definitely what mill customers they have and what products they're buying for us, you know, what size logs and things like that. So thank you for the question and thank you for keep asking it. I'm, I'm gonna do that. The other thing I wanna say is when I go to the Oregon Housing Stability Council, I talk to them about penciling out the impact on local economies. So I'm looking at macro level housing projects. I'd really like to see you collaborating with housing and community services so that Oregon Wood products build communities and build houses because they've got state and federal money. I want it, that will help give us geographical equity for housing money. It's so important. I wouldn't. I wouldn't keep pushing you on it if I didn't see the impact in our local and our rural communities all over Oregon. Thank you. Great, thank you for being with us today. So it looks like um, Ian Ferguson was able to get back on the call with us. I'm gonna let Ian go next. I'm gonna try going off mute. Looks like you might still be on mute, Ian. There you are. How about now? Yes, now? we got you. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to handle two devices at one time, I think. <laughs> so that's the problem. So anyway, the question that I had had to do with modeling the riparian uh, buffer zones. And um, it occurs to me that a, a 120 foot buffer on a large stream like the lower Nehalem River or lower Wilson or any of those coastal streams it doesn't do nearly as much good in terms of wood recruitment and shade as a wider buffer would farther upstream. That's where you get your better benefits to temperatures and wood recruitment is in the higher up in the watershed. And I wonder if any consideration was given to that in the modeling rather than a, a one size fits all for uh, the type F streams of 120 feet. Thanks. So uh, we did, um, you know, initially we were uh, looking at uh, variable buffer width for a variety of reasons. Um, some of those reasons were operational, some of those uh, reasons uh, associated with climate change um, and that sort of thing. Um, at the end of the day, what really penciled out best uh, for us, at least to this point, is, um, is having a, a simpler um, prescription so to speak, um, it worked out better for a number of reasons. I guess certainty is part of that equation too. Um, uh, Troy, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I think that, um, you know, in general, the 
we sort of let the let the process drive the you know the buffering strategy if you will so you know we we started at the beginning with what are the objectives we're trying to achieve and mike touched on those earlier you know wood recruitment in stream structure protecting certainly against temperature and sediment and then you know different parts of the watershed function differently as you know um but we you know i think both sort of traditionally and then even you know kind of modern more modern examples of buffering strategies in, in watersheds do still rely on kind of the standard approach of you know the wider buffer around the fish bearing streams kind of wherever they occur in the watershed and then as you go up the watershed um, you know the processes that you're trying to protect there are a little bit different um, and certainly a lot more flashy as it relates to the you know debris flows etc and so the buffering strategy, the buffers do get smaller as you go up in the watershed, but they still are, um, you know, accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish from a, an overall watershed perspective. So, um, you know, I think flipping it, uh, you know, I guess think about that just uh, as, as a thought exercise. If you flipped it and put the wider buffers up in the upper watershed and the smaller buffers down below, um, you know, one thing that we saw from the buffering strategy is we, you really do, at least as far as fish bearing streams are concerned, you really do get nearly all of all of your wood from the stream adjacent sources to, to fish bearing streams and so i think we would uh from a from a wood recruitment perspective i think if we had smaller buffers in the lower watersheds we would miss out on a lot of wood uh, being recruited into the system over time at least based on what the models have shown so far in this process so um we didn't explore that very, very much. Uh, we definitely, you know, uh, admittedly, we started in a little bit of a traditional place there, but I think the, the literature and the, and the uh, stream processes support that. All right, thank you. Thanks for being here, Ian. Appreciate it, these Northwest Steel Letters. So I've got left, and I'm gonna watch the time a little bit. I got about eight minutes, but I have Chad, Noah, Heath, and Dave. So Chad, go ahead. My question is for Brian and the uh, modeling work that was done. Uh, I understand that even flow constraints can be a real pain when trying to create a, a feasible model when they're the sole source of infeasibility. But even though this is a policy level model, the intent of policy is to affect practice and sometimes with unintended consequences and removing that even flow constraint could create uncertainty in mills trying to do their financial plans, could create uncertainty in your contractor base, how many people you're gonna need in any given year. And that flows through the whole industry. So could you speak to whether the even flow constraint was loosened or removed? And if it was removed, what variance are you looking at year to year now with your harvest levels? Yeah, Chad, that's a great question. Thanks for getting right to it. And so the even flow constraint was removed because the department's charged with being sustainable and predictable. And so the sustainable is that we'd have the same at the end of the permit, um, same volume that we started with. And the predictable is that we would change year to year by 1%. And so how we would do that, so 1% variance from the following year. How we would do that to show um, stability for our mill customers um, and the counties we distribute revenue to is to change in those implementation plans, so those 10 year plans. And so every 10 years we would reset that level um, and go through those changes in volume and that, that would be the predictable part of it. And again, you know, I said the services aren't permitting the harvest level, but for sure the harvest level affects the species. And so they were definitely looking at the effects of the species as that harvest level varies over time. And what we we're trying to do um, is by varying the harvest level through the life of the permit, it, gives us opportunity to provide more benefits to the species and to the local communities and to the citizens of Oregon than just being flat. So am I hearing it right that it's a 1% variance year to year with a reset every 10 years? Uh, 
Uh, we lost you, Brian. Brian, all of a sudden you went on mute. Ah, there you go. We got twitchy finger. Sorry there. Uh, yes, it is a 10% variance over 10 years, so 1% a year, Chad, either up or down. And then it's reset, and it it's hard to say after that 10-year planning period what the next 10 years variance will be, or will it be? That's no some of the information. Plan. That's some of the information we're still dialing in for the this next modeling run that we'll take to the board. So we'll have more on this um, as we get closer to October, for sure, of what it would look like. Because when we go to the board in October, we will show them the the anticipated trend lines, right? Not the absolute numbers over the seven years, but the trend lines over the seven years. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when that meeting occurs, I would encourage you to illustrate the importance of having somewhat even flow for counties that are creating their budgets around it, for the contractor base available, for the, the log prices. You know, if there's all of a sudden a lot more wood on the market that affects everybody. So there's plenty of good reasons to consider relatively even flows within that 10% bound. Yep. Okay. I, I hear you. Yeah. So more to come on that one. Thank you. Thanks for the comments there and questions. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Chad, who's with Lewis and Clark Timberlands. And next up is Noah Greenwald, Center for Biodiversity. Yeah. No, go ahead, Biological Diversity. I, I realized um, with uh, back at the riparian presentation it mentioned road management, but I didn't hear any standards around roads. You know, I know ODF used to have a performance measure around reducing the amount of hydrologically connected roads, which I don't think has been followed up on, um, seems to have disappeared. And then, you know, the, the current road density is over four miles per square mile, which is really hard, really hard on watersheds. Um, there's still road construction on mid slope, steep mid slopes that causes landslides. I've seen recent roads that were constructed that cause landslides. And so I'm just wondering how, what standards are going to be applied to roads? Is there going to be any effort to reduce the road network? Mike, are you on mute? Mike, were you speaking to this? Mike, you're still on mute. There you go. Yeah, I'm trying to moderate the noise level here before I answer the question. Uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> yeah. So in terms of actual, in terms of actual best management practices, um, we are, uh, you know, essentially a lot of our management standards are good. Um, in that respect and, and will transfer over into the HCP. Um, when it comes to uh, the actual, you know, number of roads per square mile and trying to locate those roads in better uh, situations, that really comes down to the implementation planning piece that Brian was talking about. And a lot of, a lot of things that have to get ironed out there and that we're looking for quite frankly, better stakeholder engagement. Um, and that's both on our end, trying to, trying to provide more uh, points for input. And you'll see how that rolls out, I think, over the next few months. But then also, um, you know, just getting folks more engaged in those immediate plans. So there's, there is a bit of a rub between road location and the RCAs. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is really minimize that new construction both along uh, along streams within the RCA and then also uh, stream crossings as well. We know that uh, the former, uh, we can largely try to avoid the former, but then the road has to go somewhere. But then also uh, we recognize that the latter, the stream crossings, are still going to have to occur. But the focus uh, for the HCP is really minimizing that interaction um, with, the, with the stream within the RCA. Um, the other uh, transportation planning piece and where roads are actually uh, end up being located 
is more of an implementation uh, question. Yeah, and, and really quickly, this is Troy with ICF to follow up on that. We do know we do have alongside the you know the, rip, the riparian strategy, which we talked about today, in the HCP conservation strategy, we do have uh, two specific conservation actions that are focused on road system management. So one is management of the existing system, and the other is focused on um, you know best management practices for construction of new roads. So there is quite a bit of detail in there around roads as well. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I have to note, this is still Deb Noodleman, Kearns and West Facilitation Team, and I have to note we're past the time on this section, but we have two hands left up. So I was going to ask, and Sylvia, if you just team with me on this so that Heath, Curtis, and Dave Ivanoff can be first in the queue. I want to see if Heath and, and Dave, are you able to stay for the 3.30 to 4.30 sections? Sure, but I'd like to ask my question now, if that's all right. You could just, yeah, I was just going to say that. If you just say the question, then everybody can hear it, and we'll get to it afterwards. Yep, go ahead, Heath. Oh, fine. Um, well, I, I, my question is, is, it's not clear to me how you're, this, the, the North Coast, I presume, is, you know, like Forest Grove, Astoria, and Tillamook, like the big three districts. Um, uh, if that's not a perfect overlap, I, I'd like to know, but I, uh, you know, that that projection is a, a large, frankly, it's a breathtaking reduction relative to the current AOPs for those uh, districts. Um, did these, in order to derive this number, were, did you uh, incorporate the inoperable acres, you know, the roads and intergorges and the other attributes that we discussed before? And, if that's true, uh, again, when can we see the total acreage encumbrances and percentages uh, under this plan for those categories? So, so I'm actually holding the answers on these. I know this is frustrating. I just, I have to it get to the wrap up before we formally close, but thank you for naming it, Heath. And then Dave, is there any way you could just say your question really efficiently? No, oh, I have, I have, uh... I have an observation, a couple of observations, and then uh, three very quick questions. Well, no, 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 then Dave, I, I'm gonna ask you to hold all that for after, can, can you stay after the 3.30 section? I can, but I would I would hope that maybe some of the county commissioners could, could participate as well, because what I wanna bring out for the group is, is important for historical context and to compare with where we are today. So that's, okay. that's my request. Okay, I really appreciate that. Thank you. So let's see. Um, we uh, thank all of you so much for the for the listening and the questions. I want to move so we can just officially get through the wrap up. Troy, why don't you go ahead and start us here? Thanks, Deb. I'll be brief. Um, and anyway, we have a couple of I know a couple of slides to talk through kind of um, future opportunities for engagement. <clears throat> so. Uh, a lot today on, you know, the work that's been going on over the last several months, and, um, and I know you all have, have heard various iterations of some of this over time, but I wanted to give you a sense also of, of what else is going on. Um, we know we don't have time to talk about everything, you know, at every meeting, but there is work going on on several other aspects of the HCP, and, and we've been noting today that there's more to come on that in September and, and, and then, of course, in October. Um, continuing to work with the scoping team on all of this. So whenever you hear today that this is, you know, a work in progress <clears throat> or whatever, um, that really means that we're continuing to work on it with the, with the scoping team, the technical folks from the state and federal agencies, um, and, and under the advice of the steering committee, of course. Um, when we talk about refining iterations of the policy level forest management modeling, that really is, is pretty pivotal. Um, obviously for the uh, harvest levels, which we've just been talking about, but also, as you recall, um, at least on the terrestrial side, you know, we have tied our terrestrial uh, species habitat modeling to the um, the forest inventory data, and in, importantly, that that allows us then to, as we look at the harvest uh, over time and how that plays out over the course of the seventy years, according to the model we can look at how that also intersects with the changing landscape of species habitat quality over time and then uh, come up with what effectively is the effects analysis, um, at least on the, on the uh, terrestrial side, you know, how many acres of species habitat do we think are gonna be lost over time 
what's the quality of that habitat? And then on the other side of that coin, what are the changes in terrestrial habitat in the habitat conservation areas, and, you know, uh, and even a little bit outside of the HCAs? And really that, that allows us to assess sort of the balance between, you know, habitat removed and habitat gained, right? We've made a commitment in the, in the objectives, the biological objectives, to uh, increase the quality and quantity of, of habitat for our covered species. And the one way that we intend to demonstrate that is through the outputs of the harvest modeling process, uh, the forest management modeling process. So um, I just wanted to kind of circle back on that because it is certainly important from the, the timber harvest side, but it also is, um, you know, very interrelated to the statements that we plan to make in the HCP about the conservation benefits as well. Um, and then, as it relates to that, I've we've touched on a couple of different uh, a couple of the different conservation actions today. You know, the HCAs are a conservation action. Management of the HCAs are a separate conservation action. And of course, we've heard a lot about the riparian actions. We're continuing to refine those, um, and that really those those conservation actions are everything from uh, the information you heard today, but also the specifics around. Um, you know, definitions about what, you know, roads are going to look like in the riparian areas and uh, what the, the restoration piece that I talked about uh, briefly earlier with Mary, you know, the kind of the criteria uh, that we're going to be using to evaluate restoration projects, that's housed in a conservation action. So um, I think currently we're sitting at uh, 12 or 13 different conservation actions that we um, outline in the conservation strategy chapter. So we're continuing to work with the scoping team on those uh, to get those, you know, as close as as we can uh, by October. And then we've also touched briefly a couple of times today on the monitoring and adaptive management um, program and implementation. Um, so, you know, monitoring and adaptive management, of course, are, are critical because um, we're making lots of commitments in the HCP about what we think will be achieved from a conservation perspective over time. Um, one of the key differences with the HCP is that, you know, we're also required to follow up, monitor that and report out on it on an annual basis, um, you know, to back to the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and, um, and NOAA Fisheries. Uh, so that over the course of that 70 year permanent term, everybody understands whether or not this is working. Uh, and if, it's, if it seems like it's not, we have an adaptive management program that can address changes there. Um, and then the implementation piece, there's an, an entire chapter dedicated to, to how will this all work? So, um, you know, a lot of that is kind of an, an, an administrat administrative piece of the HCP, um, but it is important to illustrate, um, you know, for the board and others, of course, you know, how will ODF actually manage this HCP over time? Uh, and it's certainly something that um, when the services are making their findings to determine whether or not to issue a permit, you know, they need assurances that, um, that, the, that all, of the, all of the commitments in the HCP can be implemented. Um, and that they can be paid for. And so those are all aspects that, um, that are in process. And you can imagine that um, you know, we're, we're sort of waiting for the dust to settle on everything that you heard today um, so that we can then finalize the details on, um, on implementation and cost and funding, et cetera. So um, just, just didn't wanna you know, leave you thinking that we had only gotten as far as the conservation strategy. We are working on some of these other aspects that, that are equally important. Um, and we'll have more to come on these um, in the coming months. So with that, um, I will uh, switch it over, I believe, to Brett, this I think. This is for Are Brett. You... Yep, yeah. this is for Brett. Thanks so much, Troy, really helpful. Brett Bronscombe, Oregon Consensus. Okay, thanks, Deb. Can, can you hear me, Deb? Yeah, all okay. good. Okay, assuming everybody can. And so Brett Bronscombe from Oregon Consensus, and I wanted to address a couple slides knowing that we're near the end and, um, First is to say, uh, this has been a lot of information coming out at you and we're at 95 participants having started with I think 112 and so two and a half hours into a Zoom meeting, it's not a bad attrition rate and whether you're interested in positive, interested in offended, the common denominator is at least the majority of folks who started are still interested and in, um, where we go with this next is what these slides are about. And so the first step is the county engagement level, and this is a stakeholder meeting, um, but the relationship with counties is different. And we wanted to acknowledge that here. And um, the primary venue for county engagement has been the Forest Trust Land Advisory Committee. 
And so as a process, um, the relationship between the board and the department and Forest Trust Land Counties is important. And we will continue with the process to reach out and engage the FTLAC venue. And apart from that, we are also, the process is going to continue to engage county commissioners uh, directly, both members of the Department of Forestry and uh, staff from the State Forest Division there, as well as uh, folks from the process team, which includes myself. And then also um, in working with the next slide here, if we can switch to that. Great, in working with uh, stakeholders, um, this, this is the rough schedule. Um, we had the meeting today, the public meeting where a lot of the meat and vegetables are now out there and um, how you all react to them is something that we wanna hear. And so from the process end, um, myself and then Deb and Sylvia with Kearns and West, what we wanted to note here is um, a follow-up meeting in early August. And I think important to note here is um, we want to do this jointly. And the reason for that um, is in part two things. One is there's not a lot of time left between now and October and um, there's limited staff capacity and we want to make sure we've got the right capacity and the right people in the room um, able to talk to folks and answer questions. And so getting something on the calendar quickly is, is the intent. The other part is the diversity of perspectives and viewpoints out there is, um, is important. And it's important to um, the project and the project team and that getting back to the steering committee and the scoping team. But also um, we feel from a process management end that it's important for stakeholders to hear from one another. And, what your interests are and how you want to try to influence and shape um, the next iterations of this work. So we'll have a follow-up joint stakeholder meeting, a big public meeting like this, where the next iteration of uh, draft work will be rolled out in September. That's September 16th from one to four. And then we'll have another uh, joint stakeholder meeting following that. Those are not the only ways in which um, we'll engage with you and aren't the only options for engagement, but at least we wanted to be intentional about uh, putting some marks out there on the calendar. And um, there are other avenues, individual conversations and ways to um, hear about concerns, answer questions that will continue to avail. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn it back to you, Deb. I think we're at the, at the 334 mark. Right. Pretty close, but great job, Brett. Thank you for that. Just the last piece from the meeting today, the PowerPoint slides will be posted right after the meeting. So those will get up on the website as soon as we can get them through the posting process. And then don't forget, there'll also be a meeting summary. So we'll make sure to, there's, this is being recorded, but in addition, within a few weeks, we always post a meeting summary for everybody to have that information. And I think just for time, Permitting, I think Liz, if we could turn to you for the formal wrap up and then we'll still have the extra hour for additional questions and conversations. You bet. Um, yeah, go ahead, Liz, thanks. Great, thank you, Deb. Um, really a tremendous amount of work that's been done here, um, represented really um, by a lot of people leaning in. Uh, really want to express how grateful I am for the leadership and support of our sister federal and state agencies. I listed the teams off in the beginning, really could not be where we are without them. It has been a truly collaborative effort and um, it's important to recognize that. So I just want to make sure folks are aware of that. Um, it is a lot of work in a short amount of time and um, thus we're in this mode of our really hot off the presses. A lot of these numbers just uh, were generated last week. So just so you know, that's really where we are in the process and wanting to keep it uh, real here for everyone that's connecting with us today. Um, really appreciate everyone being here. Your t time is precious. So I really thank you, especially during these times when everyone has just a lot of stress going on. Um, Want to definitely call specifically appreciation to the commissioners that are here today, Board of Forestry member McComb, really appreciate your time and a special uh, thanks and acknowledgement to our tribal representatives. So thank you all for your time 
it's very meaningful for us. Um, I do just want to take a few minutes. I know we're past time. There's a couple points I really want to make. And so this, I would say, is an historic moment in time in Oregon where there are three large scale HCPs at play on the landscape. Our own one for our Board of Forestry lands and some of the common school forest lands that we manage in Western Oregon. There's an effort on the Elliott State Forest in which it's endeavoring OSU is, is planning to manage that as a research forest. Our lands are being managed for greatest permanent value. And then there's a third one that's gonna be initiated here shortly that would cover private industrial forest land or private forest land. And that's an effort that has precipitated from um, a really impressive collaborative effort among conservation community and, and industrial landowners. So really phenomenal effort there. All these strings, I, all these efforts are happening at the same time. And so just, you know, it's important for folks to know that they're different. Um, they're different goals, different agencies, different landowners, different missions. There's different governing bodies, different stakeholders that care about what should come off of those lands. And so all of that means in the end, they're going to look a little different. The HCPs are, you know, and like, you know, we're going to get those HCPs. Um, they're going to look a little different um, because they need to serve the purpose of each of those landowners. Um, but we are all talking to each other. And uh, so it's not happening in a vacuum. And in fact, we're often all working with the same um, individuals from the services and sometimes the consultants uh, overlap as well. So just really wanted to um, call that to folks' attention. And then um, the second thing I'd like to say is that um, we are working through at an incredible pace. And uh, we've been, several of us have been through this before, big, you know, 10-year efforts, unsuccessful. And I think the reason it's working, the reason we're able to work so quickly now is because we learned a lot during those times, those last previous efforts where it didn't work. We learned about each other's organizations, they are separate agency missions, where they overlap. We built relationships through trial and error, and we were just really staged for success to kind of bring this thing across the finish line. And uh, I think it's really important to recognize, um, to recognize that. And then the other thing is we've continued managing these lands for those decades that have interceded, that have played out since we tried to get the HCP. So we have an, an immense amount of knowledge to bring to the table about the land base, about the political, social environment as well, which of course is a big driver here. So in the end, while there's all these different efforts going on, there's a common goal. And um, Chad Washington, I think, really called it out quite succinctly and quite nicely, which is the certainty, long-term certainty for conservation and for management. And it's those two things, being able to have that laid out in an agreement, in an, in an environment which is otherwise so uncertain, it is really hard to put a price tag on. And I, I say that because there was a, you know, you heard the harvest volume um, outputs there at the end of the presentation. And I think it took a, a few minutes for people to chew on it. And I think we're gonna end up talking about that again here in a few minutes. Uh, but I think it's really important to recognize that um, you know, without an HCP, we are going to feel the impact of increasing um, listing of threatened endangered species, of changing uh, political forces, of changing expectations for protecting the habitat for those species that, in, that would bring harvest levels down. And so that's the situation we're in. Where, do we, where is the best place to be in the case of our HCP that's in the best interest of Oregonians supports rural communities and conserves the species. So um, reminder, uh, I took, I had a bunch of great notes. Your comments and questions were awesome. We heard about reporting and maps, departure, how that impacts counties and purchasers, climate change, restoration for streams and uplands, riparian management, one size fits all, wood recruitment, really great conversation. July 22nd is a board of forestry meeting. It's, a, um, dis it's an update only, it is not a decision item. And because of the environment where everything's being done through webinar now, we're only taking verbal testimony on decision items. Mm -hmm. So this agenda item will be written testimony only. So I really encourage you to get your thoughts down and, and send them in 
um, to the department. There's a, um, we can make sure you have the contacts for that. Uh, so the board force, you can consider your input uh, while we give them this, basically this same presentation on July 22nd. Hmm. Sorry, that was long winded, but I wanted to get those ideas out. No, really important, really important, Liz. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for staying with us. Um, I wanna echo, we had about 120 folks as we kicked off. We still have around 90 left. Um, we're gonna formally wrap up what we call the official open to the public part of the meeting and move into what we call the informal time for additional discussion on topics of interest. And again, if we had the pleasure of being in a room with you, we'd be milling around now and talking in small groups and getting nice, big, passionate, heated discussions going. So we're gonna to try to mimic that a little bit with this time left. And I just wanna do my few reminders and then we'll be able to jump right in. One is remember to raise your hand if you wanna get into this piece of the discussion. Please help me with the balance of speaking time. I'm gonna do what I did before. I may skip around a little bit to let some new voices in. We've got folks here from recreation, conservation, industry, tribal, the counties are with us, and I'm sure there are many others that maybe haven't had a chance to speak up but are thinking some big thoughts that you wanna share or some questions or concerns that you have. Um, and I wanna check with Sylvia as I'm kicking off this section. I don't know if you had a chance to collect any questions on a slide, and I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but if you happen to have some of those that you are collecting, I know we've got a couple of hands up. I also thought we had one in the chat box from way at the beginning. I don't know if you're off mute, Sylvia, to help me with that one. Gosh, yeah, was I'm here. Back. Hi. Yeah, so I'm. we've been sort of collecting some of the mm -hmm. questions in our virtual flip chart notes, I guess, here on screen. Um, and I, I think some of them are maybe still outstanding. The one from the question from the beginning was about the FMP timeline right. and whether that changes even if the Board of Forestry doesn't move forward on the HCP. Um, and okay, I think there were a few other one, questions, so. but yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I'll take that first one here as quickly as I can. Um, Several of you have already been on this road with us for a while, but we've been um, in parallel paths looking at our current forest management plan, seeing about opportunities under the direction from the board to revise that plan to improve conservation and financial outcomes. So that plan has been, we've been working on that while also working on the HCDP. We wrapped up a draft forest management plan and a whole set of materials and put them on the consent agenda at the April board meeting. So there's a package sitting out there on the Board of Forestry website with the draft forest management plan, several other pieces that go along with it. Um, we're gonna review that in September with the board. We weren't able to do it in April, COVID related stuff. So it is on the agenda for September as an information item only. To the question, um, so in October, if the board should decide not to have us move into the NEPA process. We would come back to them in January with a proposed work plan. Um, we're really, we're asking for their direction of where do they want us to go next? Do they want us you know, to revive this whole process of, um, of improving conservation and financial outcomes? And what's the best way for us to go through it with them. It, it really, while we have a draft plan to work with and to work from, uh, we need to have a check-in with the board. There's been a lot of um, new board members brought on. We need to have a check-in with them in January to make sure we're on a path that they support. So someone, so that's a long-winded answer to say it's a little, un, I'm not sure what the timeline's gonna look like. Should we stop working on the HCP? Um, that was one that I just know got asked early and I couldn't find another way to slip it back in. So thank you for the help with that, Liz. And so now we did have to cut off a few people to get to the wrap up. And so I want to pick up where we left off. And we first had Heath, then we'll go to Dave. And I also saw Doug Cooper put his hand up. So Heath, um, I don't know if it helps to just state it again. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my question was, I mean, I started by saying that, you know, uh, not only is this projecting on, on the North Coast permit, permit area, I mean, a, a reduction of, you know, significant quantities relative to the current EOPs, I mean, for the 
permit area, this is almost a hundred million board foot reduction relative to last year. And I was just highlighting the fact that in order to come to these conclusions, you must have already mapped out where you think you are able to operate. And you must have already mapped out uh, where you think you can't. That is to say, where uh, your restrictions are in addition to the HCAs and RCAs. And it would be very helpful to me to know the quantities of those lands. I mean, at one point we had talked about something that looks like a 70-30 plan where there was 70% available for harvest and this is almost the reverse of that. And so uh, I'm, I'm just very curious about where these acreage numbers are landing and when we'll be able to see that. You know, Mike, you had highlighted that we may be putting that together as we approach October, but it seems it seems definitionally you must already have those numbers in order for you to have prepared these numbers. So Keith, this is Brian. I'll take those questions on. So, and thanks for being patient, absolutely. Um, so we don't have those numbers today and we are just looking at the timber harvest modeling and when we're analyzing those results, we're looking at where it's harvesting outside the HCAs and what it's doing. We don't have a must pay a feature in there. We went over this uh, last week, but we don't have a must pay feature in there. So it will harvest units that um, at a loss. And so it's basically harvesting all over the landscape. What I can tell you though is um, we will have those numbers as we refine the modeling one more time and we'll dig into that data and look at it and have it for September. But clearly, um, Mike characterized the conservation as over 50%. And so if you think about where the harvest, where the model can harvest, the, per, the harvesting area of the landscape after that is, it is less than 50% for sure. And then when you take out the roads and the administrative sites and the other sites that we can't harvest it on yet, you're getting down to definitely less than 50%, but we don't have that number today. We'll get it for you as we do more of the modeling and look closer at it. I do hope that we'll the other thing have it in time that it will inform the Board of Forestry's analysis and our ability to inform the Board of there, Forestry's analysis. For October, for sure, but not for the July Board of Forestry meeting next week. Yeah. yeah. I think the other context um, that's really important is the current harvest level. And so the current harvest level for the permit area. And so when I say current harvest levels, I should actually say the implementation plan levels. So the implementation plan levels, those 10 year plans are at 226 million board feet a year. And so using that lower range, Overall, it's a reduction of 30 million board feet, if you use the lower numbers I showed, than current. On the North Coast, you're right, um, it is Forest Grove, Astoria, and Tillamook. That reduction is um, actually 35 million board feet. So it does go down 35 million board feet on the North Coast using the lower numbers, and it goes up a little bit in the South, about plus 6 million board feet. And, and so it is a reduction. And that's relative to your current AOPs. And you have been, in my view, uh, your, your cutout has been much higher uh, in the, in sustainably so. That is to say, again, this is not only a reduction relative to the AOPs and a 35 million board foot. I mean, that's a huge fraction of a mill, but then another 100 million board feet relative to what you've been cutting out. And so that's, uh, again, uh, the adjective I used earlier was breathtaking, and I, I, I would stand by that. So we, we still expect that um, cut out that efficiencies that the purchasers get in and end up harvesting more than we sold. And so that phenomenon we'd expect would continue. Um, just like today. The other thing to note, though, is those it's the implementation plans of what we sell. Another thing that, um, before I go there, 
a reminder to all of us is that um, the forest products market has been really good. We sell three-year contracts, and a lot of those contracts are are harvested rapidly in the last couple of years because of the markets have been good. And so our harvested volume is much more than our implementation levels, volumes. But those implementation plans um, for the permit area, so on the North Coast and the Valley and South are all at that end of the 10 years. And so within the next year or two, we would have to revise those. We definitely think when we revise them there are many things at play right now um, that affect ODF harvest levels. And those things are definitely new listings like Troy talked about. Um, they're definitely finding new species. We're finding new individuals on the landscape every year that we do surveys and those all affect it. And there's also social, social things where the political pressure is and the social pressure and they play out in other ways of lawsuits that we have and also citizen surveys. And so there are many things, um, and when we think about the next 70 years, we think about many, many things that could reduce the harvest levels. And so an HCP gives us certainty, and we've said that a couple times in this meeting, it gives us certainty over the life of the permit term, but it also gives us a control over how those harvest levels are set. Either we can be in control through an HCP development or outside forces, federal listings, local lawsuits, other things will come into play. And so not only does it give us certainty, it also gives us control of the state forest destiny more so than um, not having these assurances in place. I think the other thing that um, I, uh, just one more thing, because I think Dave will have more to say on this topic, but, um, Chad had a, a good point, and I've talked about it a couple of times, and, um, you know, these are average numbers over 70 years. And if you think about that fluctuation, that's another thing we'll have uh, for the board in October, that, you know, a 20% change of these numbers on the higher end is, is significant, too, um, versus a 20% chop. So they will fluctuate um, quite a bit over those 70 years. Thank you so much, Heath, for the questions. Thank you, Brian. And I am gonna head over to Dave Ivanoff now, and thank you for being patient, Dave. Uh, thank you, Deb. Uh, I guess this this is, uh, I'll start out with a couple of comments uh, from a historical standpoint. And Liz, you and I both have the institutional history going back to the early 2000s, but coincidentally, the the range given for the harvest under the HCP on average is 146 to 153, which at, which equals 149 average. And and just for the any of the county commissioners still on the call, that coincidentally is the amount of the implementation harvest level when the counties uh, gave their their approval to the original structure-based management approach of 289 million, 279 million feet a year. And uh, six months later, it turned into 149 million. And that was the number that the counties at first expressed significant outrage in 2001. Uh, as, as Heath and Brian were just talking about, we've now lost over 50% of the land base for harvest. Uh, compared to 85% of the land available in 2006 when the H&H &H, uh, model was done. And the, the breathtaking uh, reduction in volume that Heath made reference to is gonna have, I don't know what the impact is gonna be on rural Oregon, but, but to the extent the, the social aspects of Oregon society, I don't think the HCP has addressed the impact that's gonna have on those rural communities, especially in Northwest Oregon. And I don't want my comments to be uh, suggesting that I'm opposed to the HCP. I'm, I'm just dismayed that, that the effort in, no, in negotiating the conservation strategies has resulted in this kind of a decrease in harvest levels. Historically, we've been harvesting somewhere around 50% of the total growth across the landscape. 
And at this rate, we're going to be down around 30 to 35% of the growth. And I, I just don't get that, how that is in compliance with greatest permanent value as it relates to uh, the social fabric of our rural communities. I served on a stakeholder group process uh, that was endorsed by Governor Kitzhaber to address the, the need to improve ODS financial viability and simultaneously enhance conservation outcomes. And I think that it, that, that 70 30 approach that, that our company uh, uh, was supportive of and a lot of the stakeholders uh, expressed support for would have achieved uh, significantly higher harvest volumes uh, than what these are showing, and it, and it would have enhanced conservation outcomes. Indeed, the ODF did some work to achieve long-term financial viability from the North Coast, they had to harvest somewhere around 275 million feet to, to a, per year to achieve the department's financial viability goals and to have the money to properly manage the asset. And that didn't even take into account the money that, it would, be, that would be required to convert these underproductive acres that we've basically left future generations of Oregonians with with the legacy of non-management. And to me, that's a dereliction of our duty. I don't, I don't see how we're gonna have the, the money to generate this land, the, to restore the productive capacity of all these underproductive areas. And I guess the last question I have, I, I, go, I would like to find out how we're gonna achieve financial viability and how we're gonna convert these underproductive areas when we're only harvesting the amount that's being talked about. But the last question I have in the meeting last week, uh, we talking about conservation strategies. Uh, ODF put up two different scenarios that we were going to talk about today that did not happen to my knowledge. And there was going to be a strategy that was going to be based on, on what the department believed was going to be required of ODF to achieve an HCP. And then there was another uh, uh, enhanced approach, I guess, that was above and beyond. And I believe from the county standpoint, it's important that, that any negotiation with the federal services ought to be based on sound science. And I guess, again, I'm dismayed that we have, we've ended up setting aside over 50% of the landscape, uh, not even taking into account the inoperable areas that Heath mentioned. And so I would like to know this conservation strategy uh, that has been rolled out today, is that the HCP compliant or is it somehow an enhanced approach? Because uh, I thought that's what we were gonna see today. So those are the three questions, Deb, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to uh, vent a little bit and also provide some historical context that some people may not know about. Yeah, I'll take the last question okay. first. If I can. Hey, Mike. Can. Waiting on Mike Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, sorry to cut you off, but I'll jump in there. Um, because, Dave, we met with the timber industry focus group last week and talked about the model rules because the timber industry was both interested in the model rules before the outcomes came. And so when we're working through the configurations of the HCAs, we have a couple configurations there, and those are the number of ranges that you've seen. Again, the scoping team is discussing and analyzing, but in all the numbers you saw today of acres of conservation and volumes of harvest, that's what you're seeing is different um, configurations of HCAs. And I'm going to, so as the scoping, the technical team is working through and trying to figure out and make sure we meet all the goals of the species and the benefits of them. I'm going to turn it to Troy in a minute to talk about how that work will feed into the effects analysis, but that's the process we're on now is trying to narrow down and get that last um, HCA configuration. And it's going to take us another couple of weeks uh, to get there. And once we do that, we'll have more certainty around the acres numbers, um, the volume numbers outputs, the numbers that he's tested for around the under the acres that are under or not productive um, for timber harvesting. And so really we need to 
finalize that uh, HCA configuration in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Brian, this, this is Troy with ICF. Uh, maybe just a quick note on, on the effects now. Something I touched on it a little bit earlier in that, you know, all of this is really uh, linked together and, and run through the forest management modeling process. And so while we are, you know, reporting numbers today on size of HCAs and you see some volume numbers, the other, the other aspect or the, one of the other outputs of that modeling exercise is, um, you know, what, what are, what are the expected um, acreage effects to the covered species over time and what are the expected uh, conservation benefits or, or habitat quality benefits over time. So we're, I mean, we're still processing through some of that information, uh, which is why you, 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 know, you didn't see it today. It, it, Liz mentioned this is all sort of hot off the press, so we're cranking through it. Um, and, you know, then, you know, there is an evaluation there about the sort of relative level of conservation benefit over time. What are the effects and is the conservation strategy robust enough to offset those effects? Um, and that's really the, it's the information presented in the HCP and it's really the, um, when the services are, are going through their permit issuance criteria, that's the question, is one of the main questions they're asking themselves is, are we able to demonstrate that the conservation strategy is, you know, offsetting the, um, the offsetting the take that may be occurring from covered activities. So that, while we, you know, we have a pretty good indication of that, I think that the numbers related to that are really just coming out now. We're really just looking at those now. Um, so I do think we'll have more on that in the coming weeks um, as part of the effects analysis. W one quick other note I wanted to throw in there. Um, Dave, you mentioned, uh, you know, effects on, on organ communities, et cetera. Um, you know, one, it's, it, it is certainly, it's not something that um, is, is analyzed specifically in the HCP, except that, you know, as part of the uh, achieving greatest permanent value and achieving the forest goals and objectives, which we've talked about in the past, you know, that's certainly uh, an important aspect of those forest goals and objectives and, and greatest permanent value. So uh, it, it's, it is sort of built in to the overall, um, you know, the overall process in that, in order for the uh, in order for the plan to be viable, um, you know, it, it has to achieve those goals and objectives. It has to be, you know, ODF needs to be able to demonstrate that they can achieve greatest permanent value. And so there is, you know, the sort of societal benefits are built in. So it's not analyzed specifically in the HCP, but it's kind of baked into the cake. The one thing I want to point out though, is that under the NEPA process, it will be explicitly analyzed. So there will be a socioeconomic analysis under NEPA. Um, you know, what will the effects of the, of implementing the HCP or implementing management on Oregon State Forest under the HCP be on socioeconomics? Um, and that'll of course include um, local communities. So um, I did want to note that there will be a formal and robust analysis of that under NEPA. Dave, you said you had three questions. And so um, I'm not sure I caught all three of them. So can you tell me if you thought they got answered? No, Liz. Uh, the three questions I had were how to achieve ODS ODF financial viability and how are you going to have the department, how's the department going to have the, the revenue needed to properly manage the asset, you know, inventory updates and, and address the problem of conversion of those underproductive acres. And the third question I had, I heard uh, from, from Brian and Troy is as it, as it relates to the conservation strategies, uh, I don't think I, I have a clear understanding of how that was answered, uh, whether or not it was HCP compliant or if there's somehow an enhanced component yeah. above and beyond what the department thinks is, is necessary to get an HCP because that's what I heard last week and I was really upset about that, frankly, okay. that we would well, be doing something beyond what is necessary given the trust mandate to to manage this land and achieve the goals of the HCP. So I just want a clear answer on that. And I don't think I've gotten it yet with, with all due respect. So uh, let me try then. So the 
clear answer is this is not an HCP plus. I'm not sure, I wasn't around in that conversation, so maybe some wires got crossed, but no, that's not uh, the intention here, nor has it ever been the intention. Um, I think the it's possible that you know Brian um, had a graphic there that had two different configurations of HCAs and so that's not to say one is enhanced over the other it's saying here's kind of a couple way the HCAs could be configured in the across the landscape in terms of the size of them and the distribution etc and so that might be what you're thinking of was HCP and HCP plus but we are not, that has not at all been the approach that we've taken. So um, this is wholly designed and it is not done yet. This is wholly designed to comply with the ESA. So we're not trying to exceed compliance with the, with the uh, ESA. Um, a couple times I've heard it said, not just from you, but you know, now we've ended up with these numbers and and you've landed on these numbers. We have not, we have not ended up with something. We have not landed on something. This is a work in progress. We're being transparent and showing our work as we go along. And so we are, we're far enough along to feel like, you know, confident enough to put this out in front of you, but please know uh, we are still working on this. And there's some important uh, work yet to be done in terms of just making sure the model's operating properly and, and, and assuring that we've got the best configuration for those HCAs. So, and you know, I couldn't emphasize that enough. And you you gave the lead in for it exactly, Dave, where you talked about the 279. We, you know, in no way do we want anyone here uh, in this meeting today or any messages carried forward out of here to say that we have promised X amount of volume based on the numbers we put out today. That is not what this is. This is saying we're looking at how we can manage the forest for conservation and for forest management purposes. And here are the outcomes that we think that we're going to be getting from that. So um, yet to come is operationally, what, what volume do we think this really means on the ground? That's the implementation modeling. That's where we look at 10 year periods and can characterize here's how much we think we can harvest at smaller scales. And that's where we can control the departure and come up with a solution that's good to your next question around financial viability that meets the financial viability needs of the agency and provides the support for the rural communities in the counties. And that's a really important part of that policy discussion is that departure piece. And there's a lot of ways to get from here to there. Um, was very small decrease, for example, in volume for a while until things really start coming online. A more, or, you know, a, a, a more um, assertive approach to restoration activities for those stands that uh, we need to get on a better trajectory for habitat, which gets to your question around those, you know, you're calling them unproductive stands, I think, in, for in the case where some of those acres are in our HCAs, the management of those is going to be dictated by the agreement around achieving the habitat goals for those HCAs. So what, which of those stands would we <clears throat> use? What There'll be a suite of civic cultural um, strategies, including clear cuts to restore stands that are uh, uh, senescing out alders or um, uh, Swiss nail cast stands that aren't growing. So those are those, those stands and then those same types of stands outside um, of those HCAs would be metered in um, along with our other stands um, that are revenue generating. So it's all, it's all really wrapped together, but I guess I would, I would sum it up to make sure we hit your three questions very clearly. There's no HCP and HCP plus. This is just our best foot forward for complying with the ESA. Uh, financial viability um, is important and we've got a strong eye to that. Uh, those numbers are still, we're still working on that. That's part of the continued iteration that's going to take place um, over the next uh, couple weeks. Um, and part of that financial viability does, as you've indicated, uh, need to take into account the revenue needed to, to manage the asset. And that's not just um, in terms of restoring underproductive forest lands, but it's also in terms of, of financing a robust monitoring program uh, providing for recreational opportunities, et cetera. Well, th th thank you, Liz, for, uh, for, for, uh, for your response. Um, I just, I just uh, 
would sincerely uh, plead with you guys to go back to the drawing board because based on my 20 years of crawling all over that state forest up there, I know we can do better and still and still achieve the conservation outcomes that I believe uh, we can we can achieve just like we modeled in that 70-30 approach. So I'm glad to hear that these aren't finalized and I, I sincerely hope as a taxpayer in this state that, that we don't create, you know, and exacerbate the urban rural divide, but a decrease of this magnitude is gonna is gonna have devastating consequences on the social fabric of, of small communities. And uh, so thank you very much. Thanks for speaking up, Dave. And I just want to check my Wilson. I know you had wanted to say something. Anything else? You're okay here? I think Liz got it pretty well there. Liz and Brian uh, did it pretty well in, in terms of this is not a, you know, this is just our work as we're doing it. There is no HCP, HCP plus, but, and we're not done yet. And the other thing that I want to say, and this it goes back a little bit to some of the stuff Heath was bringing up earlier, um, the mo and why we are not done modeling yet, one reason. We don't have everything dialed in, and one of those things that we don't have dialed in perfectly yet is the modeling of harvest within the HCAs. And so there's definitely still some work to be done there. We are doing it. Um, you know, we hoped that this would be helpful to bring information forward at this point. Um, you know, but it's, I think it's only really helpful if people realize it's not the end of the story. We're still working on this. We're just trying to be completely as open as we can and still get the work done. Um, so that's, that's all. Okay, great. So thank you on all this. I know I have, time's going so quickly. I have only about 15 minutes left, but um, Commissioner Thompson asked a question that I just want to drop in here. The analysis under NEPA of financial impacts, does it distinguish the cost to individual counties? Did I say that right? Commissioner Thompson, yes? Okay, good, okay. Yeah, thanks. Somebody want to grab that one? Uh, yeah, this is true with ICF. I I think um, I, I don't I don't want to answer that question, <laughs> Commissioner Thompson, because I don't know specifically the answer. I think that it certainly could. Um, I don't know that it has to. I'm, I'm not sure that there's a um, you know a, a template for what what that analysis can and cannot or or should and should not um, entail. It is something that um, you know as the public engagement ramps up around the NEPA process next year. Um, you know, I think a good question to ask the NEPA, the, the team that's doing the NEPA analysis. Um, it, you know, socioeconomics is certainly a key aspect of any NEPA analysis, and it'll be a big, a big part of the NEPA analysis for this HCP. But how that, I, I don't want to, you know, get ahead of myself and speak to how that will actually play out at this stage, because I would, I would merely be guessing. Am I allowed to speak? Yeah, yeah, I was waiting to see if you, you might want to. Yes. Thank you. Well, after the third hour, uh, I kind of recline in this. So forgive me for being a little it, more comfortable. It looks like a lovely chair. You know, We're glad uh, for you. Grandma likes her chair. So um, I would say from our point of view, it's much more useful and trust inspiring if you give us specific data. I mean, I think you've heard the historical record of the dismay that occurred because Perception was one set of data, reality was another set of data. I just want to add to the fact of the rural-urban divide. Often what urban folks seem to want is a beautiful landscape that looks like a park. They want happy servants. They want cool restaurants and shops. And so what rural people want is often something very different. So our perceptions are skewed by the reality that supports our lives. COVID has brought home that tourism as the lifeblood, the economic lifeblood of a community is even more fragile than we're afraid it was. So, so there's an increased urgency on our part when we talk to you about this. And it's so wonderful to be with uh, subject matter experts 
I'm beyond grateful. I get smarter every time I listen to you. It's just a joy. Thank you for your good cheer and hard work. That's all. Well, we are so grateful to have you with us and thank you for those words. It really helps a lot. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna do a look around and I wanna encourage if there are other voices that haven't had a chance to speak up yet, stakeholder interests that wanna be shared, questions, concerns, feedback, please feel free to jump in, raise a hand, let me know. I know I still have a couple more up here and I'm just gonna pause in case I get any other diversity of interest um, that wanna speak. And so I'm gonna, I'm just kind of watching and we have about 14 minutes left. So I'm gonna go to Doug Cooper next and then I also see Seth Barnes hand up too. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, thanks. Um... I appreciate the opportunity and I, I do appreciate Mike and all the staff uh, being opening and open with us and presenting information. Uh, I just can't understate um, the frustration though uh, with, I'll say, the process over the last year and a half and, and going or almost two now. And what I'm specifically referring to is, is working back to the business case analysis that was presented to the board and used as rationalization justification for moving forward with an HCP. So I guess that my comment would be there must be an extraordinary amount of new information that has developed with respect to uh, the minimum requirements to comply with the ESA. That, uh, as compared to where we are today. So uh, it's shocking to me that there was a business case analysis presented to the board that exhibited a harvest level with an HCP of, I'm gonna wing it off of the graph here, but that was approximately 235 to 240 million board feet in the first five years dropping down maybe a few million, maybe 5 million uh, board feet. And from that point, increasing three, maybe three or so million board feet per year to where it was over 250 million board feet per year. I trust that in the effects analysis and comparative analysis, somewhere the staff and or ICF will be able to explain, and I know this was an eco, Northwest or, you know, not an ICF report, I believe, but somewhere there must be some rationalization of what the department knew at that point in time and what we know today in terms of complying with the ESA on uh, the state lands that uh, can result in such a dramatic, shocking change in harvest volumes. So my question would be, is there anything you can tell me today that can in any way explain how that business case presented to the board could be so drastically different from the harvest volumes that were shared today? Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and then turn to um, Troy or Mike or Brian maybe to, to take it into a more detail, but you're exactly right. We do know a lot more. So we, that was based on a lot of assumptions. The business case was based on a lot of assumptions and was really meant uh, for a relative comparison, but your point is well taken and fully understand um, you know, the impact of the difference in those numbers. But you're right, we replaced assumptions with actual strategies. So that's why things are different. Um, if we wanna get into more details on that, I'm not sure which of you three, between Mike, Joy, and Brian would like to tag on there. I can help out a little bit. Um, one of the things that I would, so there's a couple of, couple of things. Um, one is the business case specifically addressed the base as our current uh, force management plan and applying an HCP under that context, under the context of DFC. Um, and also the current 
uh, uh, annual harvest objectives of the IPs and the achievability of that going forward under certain assumptions of future encumbrances undertake avoidance versus certain assumptions of an HCP. So Liz is right. One one big factor is we have the strategies in. Although I I really want to remind people, let's look at this and realize we don't have we don't have it completely dialed in yet, uh, especially harvest within the HCAs and what that looks like. So we really don't know that volume number. Another thing I would point out is there's a difference in in the modeling. Um, so you know what Richard Haynes did for the for the business case, what he it was non-spatial, it was entirely non-spatial, and so he was really it had what we did was we provided our what's become uh, fairly well known now uh, our constraints over our inventory, and so that had a lot of areas or a lot of acres that he couldn't harvest. They were not specific polygons he was dealing with. We just gave him the acre numbers to deal with. And he extrapolated from that based on where we thought those things would come out of the inventory. So there's that piece. But the other piece that's a little bit different is with the HCP, you know, it doesn't have the forest management plan overlay or the current annual harvest objective from the IPs. And so what it what it's really doing is it doesn't find volume on that same trajectory of variance. So where at, you know, and, and, and any model will do this, you know, if you allow it, it'll start higher than you're really going to start. Um, and it'll do things that, you know, it'll, it'll do various types of departure scenarios that you really aren't going to be able to implement. And that's something that we still have to get our heads around as well. And so, I mean, I, I would offer that up um, in that it is a different model and the functionality is is different in how the, uh, uh, as Richard Haynes would have put it at the time, the harvest request is, is, being, is being made. Um, I know that's not going to be a very satisfying answer for you, but that's some of the nuance in there that really is making, I think, quite a bit of difference in, in how it performs. I don't know if Brian has something to add. Trying to find the mute button. Doug, as we're getting ready for the board meeting in October, we are revisiting um, and repackaging the business case and in, in, to a comparative analysis so the board members can see the expected performance of the current plan versus the revised plan we'll talk to them about in September and then this HCP package and it is those relative terms and we have a lot more information on the HCP in some ways it played out you know like we thought in other ways it didn't but absolutely you're right to your question. We don't have all the answers today, but we need to provide answers to the board in October too, as to what is different in the HCP compared to what we thought about in the business case analysis. You know, that business case analysis was a <clears throat> thoughtful exercise, but it was, you know, just a, it was on a lot of assumptions um, to really work with the board to see who we should kick off this HCP development. So we are in a much different place than we were, you know, two and a half years ago when we were working on that. So more to come on that, but I appreciate the question for today. Deb, um, as long as we're on the, this is not answering the question about the comparative analysis, Doug, but maybe just to the, to the conversation around harvest levels, it, it's clearly the, the angst that we're all feeling. And um, we struggled uh, because, you know, we've caveated this up one side and down another all day long today. So we did struggle with even putting the numbers out for that reason. The other reason we struggled is because, and we talked about the departure piece uh, several times now today, is, um, and Mike was touching on it just now, you know, the model can, I'll, I'll use the term, you know, kind of go after 
um, a certain level of harvest based on the, the model assumptions. And so those harvest, the, the range is quite wide around that um, average harvest level. And we just, given that there's so much conversation that still needs to be had, because it, it truly is a policy conversation around how to handle departure, um, we weren't comfortable putting that range out. Um, but suffice to say that current harvest levels are within that range. So that's the problem with averages, especially a 70 year average. So I just would encourage, um, give us some more time to, to really make sure that we are comfortable with the model and we're ready to have a really good, robust conversation around departure. Recognize that an average number covering a 70 year period is just, you know, kind of lackluster in my mind uh, in terms of the concerns maybe that you all are uh, putting on the table today. Okay, thank you for your responses. Yeah, thank you for the great questions and for being here. Really appreciate it, Doug. Um, you know, I have a couple more that came in through the chat. So I want to mention I have three folks that would still like to speak, and it sure would be nice to let all three get their questions and feedback out. So I have um, Noah, we got years a little while ago, Greenwald from Center for Biological Diversity. And then I also have Mark Rasmussen and Seth Barnes. So Noah, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I just have a quick comment, which is, you know, I'm a little concerned about the comments that basically imply that timber volume is synonymous with rural interests. And I would note that, um, you know, our salmon populations are way down. The reason why coho were listed, um, one of the primary reasons was state forest management. So we've, we've lost our salmon populations and logging has played a role in that. And that's, you know, really well documented at this point. And that affects fishermen who were a big part of those rural communities historically. Um, and I would note, you know, that we've just learned a lot more in the last 40 to 50 years about forests, about the impacts of logging and roads on forests, on fish, on streams, on water quality, and uh, rural communities feel those impacts more than anybody else to some degree. And I, I think some of the work that Oregonian has done recently really well characterizes that. Um, I think, you know, looking at history, we should note that you know, these areas were some of the hardest hit early on. Um, they contributed to the logging, contributed to the fires that happened. That's known as the Tillamook burn. Then the billion board feet that was salvage logged afterwards um, sharply contributed to the impacts on fish populations. So, you know, we're, we're living in a more nuanced and complex world. And I don't think timber volumes are really, you know, the end all and be all for rural or urban communities. I just wanted to make sure someone said that. Appreciate your being here and for speaking up. Thank you so much. Um, so that was Noah. And then if folks don't mind, I'm just, I'm trying to keep with my balance of speaking time. I'd like to let Mark Rasmussen go next. You still here, Mark? There, Jason, you had said he had a, yeah, I'm not Question sure. If, for us? Did we lose him? Draft? He was on the phone, so I'm not sure if he's going to be able to unmute oh. timely. Well, you, do you have a question you can forward to us? For uh, he, he emailed his question, and the question oh. was, um, does your analysis show that the department will remain financially viable under the HCP, or are you counting on supplemental funding? Okay, so that's... Uh, I information that we're getting ready for the board for October, but we haven't gone to that level of detail um, because really we're focused on getting this last model run put together, focused on the conservation strategies, focused on the HCAs, and to, before we do that economic analysis. So we haven't looked to answer that yet. All right. Appreciate the question and for your being with us, Mark. And um, Seth Barnes, thank you for your patience. Why don't you go ahead now? Yeah, so I had a very similar question to Mark Rasmussen's, and frankly, what the the I remember a couple of uh, uh, of uh, when I was early on in this conversation back in 2015. Uh, I remember I th 
think it was specifically Brian uh, presented uh, in front of the FTLAC. And I think it was a number of presentations where it was, there was this chart that was used or this graph that was used frequently that showed you know, financial viability on the chart and where we, where we were at in terms of harvest. And remember, we were coming out of, out of a recession at that point and trying to, and the department was uh, trying to climb back out, which is kind of what kicked this whole conversation off was the, you know, trying to get to a point of viability for the department and frankly, optimal uh, levels for the, as, as much as possible for the counties. And uh, Kitzhaber at that time directing, you know, these took the twin goals of increasing conservation and increasing uh, uh, financial uh, viability. Um, and I'm wondering uh, two things. Uh, uh, does this plan uh, in your views or does the currently a sitting, does this, uh, does this do that for both in your minds? Uh, because to me, it seems like it's doing this uh, and then the other question I ha would have is with regards to presentation as you as we move forward. Um, or do you anticipate bringing to the board uh, those same sorts of graphs that show the viability and the delta that this will ine inevitably produce between what it takes to run the program and, and what this looks like it's going to bring, bring in? Seth, I'll take that one. As far as um, the graphs. I think I kind of remember from 2015, um, but probably not the exact graph. I do know, I know a couple of people have mentioned Kit Sopper and, and the stakeholder engagement we had back there and, and, it, and a real focus on financial viability. I'd say we all know we've got a different governor and, and a different makeup on the Board of Forestry, so we're still you know what that just puts in my mind is we've been working on this for a long time and so that is a good reminder for sure the graphs we tend to use will be similar to the ones we've used in the original business case and so really trying to <clears throat> in this comparative analysis which will be put together for the board similar to the business case um, using similar types of graphs and it will look at our the departments, the divisions, um, financial viability over the long term. One of the things we've really come to realize is um, financial viability, you can only have that if you have business certainty, if you know you're going to be able to operate next year and the year after that, and at what levels. And an HCP provides that. And so that is key for financial viability is that business certainty. And it also provides that certainty for the species. Where take avoidance, um, does not provide that to business. It's a real high risk endeavor and in both the cost to implement is always changing and always increasing. And the assurances just aren't there that you can operate, continue to operate under the current plan. And so a key tenant of financial viability is uh, business certainty and business stability. And so while that's not hard numbers, that's a policy choice, a business choice, if you will, that we're definitely looking at. Thank you, Seth, so much for being here and for the question. Thank you, Brian. I'm just kind of looking around. It really is 4.30-ish, and I just wanted to pause for another minute um, in case there's anybody else. Um, I also want to note we still have over 50 people with us, and we're so grateful for you staying with us during this informal discussion time. And it's just so helpful to the team that's still work in progress. And your feedback and your dedication makes a lot of difference. Um, it looks like Noah, you might still have another comment, maybe just a short one, and then we'll head towards wrap up. Go ahead, Noah. Yeah, I'd, I'd just note on the economic viability question that, you know, and this relates back to my comment about roads earlier, you know, that four square miles over four square miles of road per square mile, which, you know, really has a, has a profound impact on watersheds, leads to a lot of sediment getting into streams, um, leads to a lot of landslides, is essentially a debt that's been accrued um, at the benefit of the timber industry and at the expense of, of Oregonians. And eventually, eventually the legislature will have to put public money into fixing that problem it may not happen through this process, but eventually that will have to happen. 
And that's something that's often not recognized as that debt that is created by that road system. It's also true on public lands as well, that there's this road system that's just sitting out there, is gonna constantly need maintenance and um, causes a lot of problems. So I just wanna note that. Appreciate that. Well, we are somehow, the time flew by and we've all been really dedicated to stay with us. I wanna remind everyone about the piece Brett said earlier during the wrap up, which is that we do have joint stakeholder meetings in early August. We've got another open to the public meeting September 16th, and we'll continue with some more um, joint stakeholder meetings after that again. So please stay in touch. Um, please remember that the door is open and um, your voices and your interests matter deeply to Oregon Department of Forestry. So grateful for the time and effort. I wanna hand it back over to Liz for just a final wrap up, just because it's you. And so anything else you wanna say as we close the meeting? Just thanks everybody for sticking around. I feel like I have plenty of air time today. So really appreciate everyone's time and be well. Great, thank you so much everyone. Meetings officially adjourned. Look for the summary on the website and the slides too. Take care everyone, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thanks all, thanks for being here. Thanks everyone. Bye.